the hearing scheduled for 7 p.m., the continuation of a hearing on the definitive subdivision for Kensington Estates off Glendale Road, um, as published February 9th and February 16th of 2012. Just so everybody knows, um, we're going to be hearing from the applicant. We'll hear comments from the public. We won't be voting on this tonight because the DPW has not issued the stormwater permit, and we can't vote until the DPW has issued the stormwater permit. So no matter what happens tonight, we're going to be continuing this <coughs> to a future meeting. So that being said, I will ask the applicant, who's representing the applicant? Come on up. Good evening. My name is Peter Wells. I'm with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to run through the early part of this presentation rather quickly because we've seen it before, but I know there are some people here that might not have seen it. Um, so <clears throat> Kensington Estates is a 55-acre parcel that's off of uh, West Hampton Road and Glendale. There's three access and frontage points, West Hampton Road and two off of Glendale. This is a, a USGS locust map. Uh, which shows our parcel and the surrounding areas. A little hard to see. Uh, this basically just just shows the existing. The 55 acres characterized by. That's better. Um, it, it's a mature woodland toward, toward the rear and an old field. Let's go back to. Yeah. Anyway, there's there's wetland resources on site. There's a intermittent stream that bisects the parcel. Um, it's zoned rural residential with an overlay district. Some visuals of the site itself. This is off of Route 66, looking into the site. Uh, portions of the site that used to be a farmland and uh, uh, various crops, mainly corn. Looking down Glendale, going toward uh, East Hampton. Uh, our site is on the right here. This is the area toward, toward the rear of the site that will be left open space and preserved. This is the intermittent stream uh, last year when, when it was dry. Uh, this is our, our list of abutters that we've been working with for the past many years with, with regard to their, their concerns and try, trying to address as many of them as possible. Project hi history, it started in 1989, so it's been over two decades. We've gotten preliminary approval 1990, 2003, and 2009. It's one of our longest running projects. Um, these, this recent submission has been up to a definitive. Uh, we have responded to new regulations when it comes to uh, wetlands and Route 66 winding and Conservation Commission um, uh, approved the uh, wetland line and stream in 2010. <coughs> this site, this slide shows uh, the submission last year uh, of the definitive plan and shows the concerns that we heard at our last meeting uh, over the summer. Uh, the bus shelter location uh, needs to be moved after talking with the school department. Uh, there was insufficient road and tangent angles. Uh, the DPW made that point that their regulations say they want 90 degrees and they want 100 feet of straight road coming into any roadway. Even though we we didn't quite quite agree with them in terms of safety, this road was as safe as a uh, 100 degree tangent. But we went ahead and uh, made that note, and uh, we have addressed it, which I'll show you in a minute. This is the approximate house location across the street that uh, requested some screening from uh, headlights that are exiting here and turning left, uh, and there was lack of screening uh, toward the uh, southern portion as you enter um, uh, the point. So we, we made those notes and have addressed them with a new design. Um, 
we have a 100 foot tangent at a 90 degree angle here. And in doing so, we had to uh, realign the roadway and realign many of these lots in terms of where, where they're located and their sizes. It's still the same concept in general. We have 24 lots that vary in size from a quarter of an acre on up to three quarters of an acre. Um, after speaking with the DPW regarding concerns that they had, um, both from a design, not, not design, but utility and maintenance standpoint, we have opted to go with a totally private road. Uh, so it will be maintained and owned and managed by the Homeowners Association. Um, One more time on the, the, the lot sizes, I'm sorry, you said. Um, Excuse me, first, you address all questions to us, please, sorry. let him speak. The lot sizes are a quarter of an acre to three quarters of an acre in size. Thank you. Uh, we've relocated the bus shelter to become, to be off of Glendale Avenue. Uh, we've added more screening, both vegetation but also fencing uh, in this area, and we've added screening across the the road in Glendale to prevent uh, head headlights from shining into the living room of one of our butters. Um, other minor changes that, that have occurred, uh, the roadway itself is still the same width. It's 22 feet wide. We have two speed bumps for traffic calming. Uh, we are going with bituminous curbing for the majority of the roadway with the exceptions of the um, intersections both at Route 66 and Glendale, will be granite. Uh, Drainage-wise, it hasn't changed much. We have re responded to the DPW minor concerns with regard to this invert should, should be two inches higher. Uh, this should be labeled this way. Please provide a uh, detail of, of the catch basins, minor things that are more clerical than uh, deal-breaking. Uh, our open space re remains the same. It's, uh, we have 65% open space. 50% uh, is required for an open space development like this. So we have close to 36 acres uh, of open space, which, is, which I think makes the project quite, quite unique. Um, our storm drainage system still, well, I'll go over that in a sec with our new slide. This is a cross section of the roadway. As I mentioned, it's still 22 feet wide. Uh, we will have granite curb at the entrances, and we're going to have Cape Cod by bituminous berm for the roadway itself. Um, our tree belt has 120 shade trees in it uh, of six different types of shade trees. Right? Rather than pack in with one or two types and possibly get uh, hurt when um, disease occurs, we have six different types. Um, so, the alternate bus location, here's a detail showing where the alternate bus location is going to go. Uh, our walkway coming across here, then, then it's going to cut in front of the bus station uh, for easy access so that children or children can wait here and gain easy access to transportation right Right, right off of the roadway. This shows the bus, uh, bus shelter design. Uh, we still have screening along here, screening along there, vegetative screen across the street. Open space, I, I mentioned 50% is required. We have 65%. Uh, percent. Wildlife habitat impacts, uh, there was an independent study done by New England Environmental. Uh, we saw no wildlife impacts uh, whatsoever. There, there are no rare wildlife habitat species on, on the site. Um, and wildlife corridors also have, have not been uh, altered. Drainage and utilities. Our drainage design has stayed the same. Water from this wetland will, will, will hit this diversion berm, then be piped, and it, it all ends up in a detention basin with an outlet and a level lip spreader. Um, 
water will, will be treated as per uh, subdivision regs and um, <coughs> regulations. There'll, there'll be an infiltration trench back here to uh, pick up water from, from this end of the development. Uh, and e everything will outlet down uh, in an area where, where you will not basically see it. <coughs> Waiver requests. I, I think Carolyn has a list of what waivers we are asking for. They're fairly simple. We're asking for a reduction in the radius of the uh, roadway as it enters Glendale. It's a 10-foot existing property line uh, radius there now. Typically, the town asks for 30. Um, it does no, it has no impact at all to the engineering design whatsoever. Uh, we have asked for not providing a full traffic study, but we have provided traffic counts with regard to how much traffic will increase with this uh, development. So, site distances were measured for safety purposes. This is the roadway coming out onto Route 66. Uh, we have 768 feet as you look south entering. Uh, we have 584 to the right. Uh, on Glendale, it's 700 feet as you come out and look north, uh, and 550 as you look right. More than enough distance so that one can enter and exit safely. Mark Donald from my office is going to talk a little bit about a little bit about low impact development and uh, ways that we have provided some, but not as much as the DPW had requested. Um, again, Mark Darnold from Berkshire Design. Uh, low impact development, we try to incorporate this from the early stages of the project. Uh, we were looking at different ways to provide it, and uh, low impact development is not necessarily at the end of the project you throw in some best management scenarios. You really have to go through the design process. And one thing we looked at was trying to um, Reduce the impervious services, so we do have a narrow roadway, which is uh, more typically required. Um, we reduce the lot size, the uh, open, uh, cluster development reduces the amount of development on the site. And part of the uh, lid process is you see what else you can do for um, alternative and low impact development. And one of the things we considered is um, impervious, <coughs> a permeable pavement. We looked at that. We thought that'd be a great idea. We'd love to do that for, especially a private road, even a public road. We'd try to examine that. But we are in a critical area because we're adjacent to the uh, landfill, and DEP regulations do not allow that. So we, we examined that and tried to do that. Uh, we looked at country drainage. Country drainage is essentially trying to get rid of the pave, uh, piped infrastructure. You essentially let the water run off the roadway, go across overland flow, and take care of the uh, water quality issues that way. And, and, um, decrease the amount of development associated with the hard piping of the scenario. That sounds good, but we looked at doing that. There were several reasons that we did not go that route. One was the fact that we have other criteria that we have to comply with. We have to maintain and attenuate the flows, not only from the roadway, which would accept the road, the country drainage, but also we need to collect enough water to uh, attenuate the stormwater as well. So we needed to collect the water before we could attenuate it. We also had to treat it in accordance with DP uh, water guidelines, and the country drainage would not allow us to do that. Another reason we didn't do the country drainage was primarily because if we do that, essentially you wind up with a ditch on both sides of the road to collect the water. Uh, we have a situation where we have multiple driveways. If we have a ditch along the side of the road, we'd have to have a culvert on each driveway. And then the culvert has to be deep enough to accommodate the culvert as well as cover over the top of the covered as well. So the ditch would have to be uh, two, three, four feet deep. And in addition to that, that's in the location that we have the tree belt uh, and sidewalk. So it'd be a difficult scenario to put in there with all the different cross culverts. It also would create a problem with uh, snow plow. When they plow the roadway, it essentially would uh, fill the ditch with snow. We don't really have an alternative to do that. So we would like to have done that, but it didn't really seem uh, like a, a viable alternative in this particular situation. And rain gardens are essentially the same type of thing. You can collect several locations for rain gardens to do the treatment. But it's similar to the uh, country drainage. Once you've collected it, you still have to uh, get rid of the water. So we'd have to have a collection system to gather the water once you went through the rain garden and still take it to a disposal site. So 
we'd have to have a duplicate scenario, um, and it doesn't really fit into it. So we did look at um, options to treat the water with different best management practices, but I think we, what we wound up with, we know it works. It satisfies all the requirements uh, from BEP as well as the Northampton Stormwater Regulation. So, um, and then I guess in a quick summary, um, 24 lot proposed, um, a third, a mile. third of a mile roadway, has traffic calming measures. We have speed bumps as well as a narrow pavement, a narrow roadway. It has public water, has a private sanitary sewer system, a private drainage system, and has a, a significant amount of open space. So that's our real quick summary of the project. Is that it from the uh, Yes. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I'm just curious about the choice of uh, bituminous um, curbing. Yeah, we, in my experience, it doesn't last very long once you start ending up with plants. It doesn't, if, if it was a uh, type 2 vertical curb, bit bituminous curb. This is a Cape Cod, which is very n narrow, wider, and plows have, have uh, much little uh, problem with, with that. So it just rides up? Yeah, it, it, it rises up uh, oh. gradually, and it, it, it works quite well. You, you can also drive over it. So we don't have to worry about uh, 24 curb cuts with curbing because of the driveways. Right, it's just not going to stop disintegrating. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. That's okay. Just a, a question uh, about lots one and two, I think. Oh, know. good point. Yeah, can we talk about those? Sorry. Yes, lots one and two, uh, we, we are staying out, out of the wetland buffer. And in doing so, we have created con conservation <coughs> restrictions for these two lots in, in order to stay, stay out of the buffer and make sure that the homeowners that live in these two lots have that restriction. Uh, so um, work will not be done in that areas, and there, there will be a legal uh, restriction on that. And so it makes the, these two lots smaller in size, but still buildable. The, so the, the lots are going to end, I mean, I guess looking at the, the light blue to me says the lot ends at the berm, or does the lot actually extend toward the, the drawing? The lot area extends toward, toward the rear, but but the berm uh, constitutes an area of uh, no no enter, basically. So from from the berm back, all this area, uh, there, there will be a restriction, but it's part of the lot area in total. So a lot. What does that mean for the for the owner of that lot? Does that mean they, they couldn't mow it? Or they could not right. put a swing set on it? Nope. They own it, but, but they, they can't, can't do anything, anything with it. There is? Yeah, it happens. There, there, there are many places in the city where that's been done. It's hard to sell something that can't be used. What's that? Have you seen bodies selling something that can't be used? Well, I mean, it's passive mm -hmm. open space. So it adds value in that regard, but you just and in fact, there are a lot of lots in the city that aren't necessarily regulated by a conservation restriction, but they're in the buffer. And if people go and mow and cut the trees down, they're going to get fined. Well, what we've had those in the past, though, is where the lot ends. And the lot is the user can, the, the owner can mow it, put a swing set on it. But it's like it opens up onto a conservation area. Right. So we've talked in the past about putting fences up or or bollards or markers, right. so they know they can't infringe on it. This is the first time I remember seeing a lot where your backyard is yours, but you can't do anything with it. Well, except there'll be a berm here, so that will be sort of the physical <clears throat> indication of where that line is, because the berm is there to prevent water from flowing right into oh, sure. the basement right. of those houses. Right. Um, I'd also li like to mention, if I can, uh, we've been speaking to this abutter that, that is a adjacent to our lot and uh, we are working with them in terms of trying to figure out what type of fencing can go up here to, to prevent people from walking onto their property um, and we were concerned about wildlife habitat and so forth so so we're we're in negotiations as far as trying to figure out what type of fence can can go there uh, and can it will it prevent people but not wildlife so we're not sure uh, what type might go there, but we're we're speaking to them and we're open to that. Sorry, just uh, going back to lot one and lot two again for a second. 
because the, the berm essentially cuts lot one in half, and a third at least of lot two, the houses, uh, you're going to have to plant a house in there. The setbacks are going to be, I mean, it's only 50 feet from the road to the berm. So uh, it's more than that. Yeah. Well, on the one end, it might be, but um, there's a 25 foot front setback, I believe, on the on cluster lot. Which, which, and, it's and about 50 feet on the far end, and it might go up to say 65 to 75 feet. But yeah, are you going to be able to hit a 25 foot setback on the front and, and also get the house in there such that the house there's some usable area behind the house that doesn't go up against the burn? It's, it's going to be tight, there's no, there's no doubt about that. We're not sure what size house, house is, is going to go there, it's, it's probably going to be one of the smaller ones. Uh, on lot two is, you know, if it's 75 feet from the street to the back of the berm on lot two, you're essentially going to have a 50 foot area that you can build a house in and have a, some sort of usable back area. Right. Area the right. So you're not, it's not a very big space. No. Is the, the street one way or two way? Two way. Um, and maybe, I know we, you guys did a quick overview, but the sides, um, the 100 foot, uh, the 90 degree angle onto West Hampton Road, the bus shelter, any other lot reconfiguration? You said you had to reconfigure the lots a bit? Yes. So Most of the lots were reconfigured in this area. Uh, they, they moved around. Lot 24 used to be a little bit further south. Yeah. Um, so they're all about the same size as they were previously. Okay. Um, do we want to talk? You guys have the DPW comments, and you guys, so members of the board are aware of this. Typically, when we've seen this application before, the applicant was, was proposing that the city eventually takes over the road. Like many subdivisions, basically, you know, the, the goal is to get the city to take over the road, which means the city is responsible for plowing. Not only plowing, but maintenance of utilities, the water lines, all the stuff that's on the road. The DPW said they're not taking this road. In fact, they've said it very clearly that they're never going to take this road. And in the conditions you'll see that Carolyn handed out to us tonight, one of the conditions we would have to put on this permit is that they understand that there is no way the city will ever take over maintenance, plowing, or the uh, utilities on this road. So that the homeowners association is going to be responsible not only for plowing it, but also say if the water main breaks, they take care of it. If the utilities break, they take care of it. The city's not going to be doing anything. Okay. What's the city's reasoning on that? Is the DPW reasoning? Carol, do you want to? Um, the main reason was um, that I think sparked this was the concern about the the high groundwater um, on the uh, West Hampton Road and of the project, um, where the water lines and a portion of the um, sewer, where the sewer would be um, would be private anyway, but um, was uh, in high groundwater and <coughs> maintenance long-term um, viability of those lines was a concern. Right, so we've had, uh, we have many situations where we have associations managing, for example, Maple Ridge Road. There's an association, and Maple Ridge, that association, all they have to do is pay the taxes on some little piece of land and maintain um, landscaping. But the city plows it, and the city's responsible for the for the utility zone. In this case, the city would never take over this road. So the homeowners association would be responsible forever. One of the points of making it acceptable to the city is so that it's built up to the standards, the higher standards. Well, in, in fact, the Andrews point, if the city was taking over this road, I think they'd have to use granite curbs the whole way. Right. So. Well, it's kind of a loophole, isn't it? It's something to take into account. I mean, uh, I was trying to think of a precedent again where the homeowners association is responsible for this level of management, and I think in the in the in the, uh, the notes you found got from Carolyn, the suggestion was that there's a management company that somehow deals with this. That the homeowners 
the 26 or 24 families living on the road might want to contract it out, have somebody else maintain this road. Right, so you have a similar situation at, um, at, at the Oak subdivision, right? The road and everything, all of the infrastructure is private. And then the Pathways co-housing and the other co-housing are all, it, it's like a, it's a condominium association, essentially. Um, you by Oak, you mean Yes, Emerson Way. Right. So that's a full road. It's built to set the standard. standard. Um, but they, um, the applicant, and the way it ended up was that that was going to be an entirely private road, and irrevocable covenants were written into it so that the street would never be requested for street acceptance. But it is complicated because you've got all these complicated infrastructure systems that homeowners don't necessarily know what to do, or they have public water, they're gonna, their first in, you know, um, inclination is probably to call DPW. So there really should be some established mechanism for people who buy into this to understand who they need to call, what they're calling for, and then and, and have that so people are calling <coughs> DPW to say, hey, my water line's broken. DPW is just going to turn around and say, sorry, you need to figure that one out on your own. Do we, do we have authority over that? The planning board? Yeah. They're offering as a, I mean, you have authority to, to put it in a condition that they need to establish a system okay. protocol. Yes, you can do that. Okay. Uh, and it's really a protection of the homeowner. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. And so whoever buys into that knows exactly what they're buying into. But very much, I think, well, usually an association is part of the deed, right? It's a deed. It doesn't go on the deed of the house. Of the, the, yeah, the, it would yeah. be there. There'd be a master deed or, or a, co um, a series of covenants or um, homeowners association. Yeah. Trent, as the current subdivision regulations go, then granite curbs are not required, but they are required for the city to accept the street. Or um, I just want to look. At, you all recently changed the um, in the last few years what the requirement is. I'm just pulling that up. And we're considering changing some of the regulations again. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly in more of an urban area, you um, you would want granite, and you wouldn't want a waiver on that. Um, well, I thought it was we changed the cluster regulations that clusters have to build the roads to subdivision standards, so a cluster has to use the granite. The subdivision, you said, has to match the city standards. Right, subdivision has to match the city, city standards. Standard. Right. It's private, then they don't Right, so this is a road that the city will never take over. Does that mean Yeah, I, right. I have some difficulty with the idea of allowing a road that the city will never take over. Um, I agree. And not having it built to city standards. I mean, I think that ultimately, 20 or 30 years down the line, even if you, I don't know, I'm just a little bit leery of the idea that will let it be built to sub, substandard, but it might come back to bikers. 30 years down the road. Well, you know what we can do? We, Carolyn's looking it up, but... Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, go ahead. The, the way you change the standard, it did go from, I mean, you had a lot of bituminous um, curb allowance, um, and I didn't, um, I think I had this in my list of waivers, but the, um, for, it, it says specifically, all curbing and edging shall be granite and consistent with the requirements below for existing streets and in exceptional circumstances, the planning board will consider waivers to allow concrete curbs, but never to allow bituminous. That's clear. So what, what for city for? Well, those are for the subdivision. Those are the subdivision right. rules. Right. So it doesn't, even if it's going to be a private street, you still want it to be built to a standard. Right. And right. so just because it's private doesn't mean a lesser standard is necessarily appropriate. Right. It's, right. Not, it's not appropriate. I mean, you are, because again, you're thinking about the long term and if, particularly if the, if the homeowners are going to be on the hook for repairs and that kind of thing. My tomb is break down breaks down much more quickly than either concrete or simply granite. Um, it's the gold standard essentially. So um, every study I've ever seen says that in the end, granite is cheaper. 
Go ahead, Fred. Out of all of this, does it mean that they can't put bituminous um, curbs in? Well, I guess that's the. Or, I think what Carolyn's saying was was there a request for a waiver so they could use bituminous? I didn't see that officially requested as a waiver. But it's also. Right. So I guess one of the things for you guys to consider is the fact that the, the zoning is written such that you guys need. I'm sorry, the subdivision rules are written such that you need granite curbing along with like this. Okay. I didn't look at it either, but I have a question. It is, did we shift to OSR criteria, or are we still a subdivision? This is still this is a subdivision and a special permit. And the special permit is for the cluster of the units in the open space. But it's still, it's two permits. So, you, so you, you're doing the special permit for cluster, but really sort of abandoning the subdivision, because the subdivision would require the street to be built to city standards with granite curbs. But I was unaware of a requirement for an OSR to have that. I, I just don't. No, no, no. No, I think that well, the, the, there's another provision that says if you were doing a cluster without subdivision, without a subdivision, we still want you to build sidewalks and things like that to the subdivision standard. That's not the situation in this case. But this would be sort of a private condominium development. Why? I mean, the first one that came into play, I think, was Beaverbrook, and then the one off of um, North Street. There wasn't a new subdivision street created, but we wanted the sidewalks and the curbing to be. Well, Ice Pond was a combination of the two. Ice Pond had some lots, by the way. I think Ice Pond was before we did that. Right, Ice Pond has some lots with the conservation restrictions on the back of them also. Okay. Right, but that's a subdivision street, too. But it is a subdivision street, that's right. It was built to city standards, right. and the city accepted it after it was constructed. Right. But I think one of the things we did with, like with clusters after Ice Pond, that we changed the rules with clusters. Now clusters, even though the city will never take over the streets, we're still having clusters built to city standards. Well, there are two. You could do a cluster without creating a street. So that's what I mean. Right. It's, it's right, right. But when the cluster creates the street, the cluster has to build a street to city standards. No, a, a city street. A ci <laughs> we want all. We want all infrastructure that deals with roads and sidewalks to be built to one standard. So we we use the subdivision standard. So that was changed in the zoning. So now the zoning reflects, no matter what kind of project, reflects the same standards as in subdivision. But we can forget about that for at this point because this is a subdivision. This is filed as subdivision. It's a new street. But it also happens to have the land use pattern is coming in as a cluster special. I understand, but the, the, at the last minute, the DPW said, it, even though it's filed as a subdivision and preliminary subdivision plans were approved, which would be a city street, the DPW said, we don't want the street. We don't ever want the street. Right. DPW does that consistently. I understand that. They don't want to be in charge of anything. I understand that well. <laughs> but, but they decided at the last minute, after the preliminary was approved and everything else, they just wouldn't take the street. So you know, I... So we want just I want to end for one second because I, 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 we want to end from the public. We know we can't vote tonight. Um, I think what we're going to have to, you know, we have this issue: Are they allowed to use bituminous on this road? Subdivision standards say no. I mean, you can waive any of the standards, but right. it's very clear about. So they would have to apply. Your understanding is they'd have to apply for a waiver they, if they want to use bituminous curbing on the street. That was not specifically requested. Okay, so let's do this. We, we're going to we're going to continue it. You're going to have a chance to respond to that either at the next meeting or with Carolyn in between. So let's leave that as an open issue right now that, that might be, and move on with the next thing. Okay. <coughs> Mark? Just a quick question for just a precedent. This, the, the trigger for here for DPW not wanting to take it was the high water table. What was the trigger at Emerson Way? There were some other waivers, um, I think the street width and the, the way that it was. Um, it was in, I can't remember precisely all the details of that one, but it was essentially a one-way in street with emergency egress. And it, and so at that time, there was a concern. Um, there, were, there were a couple of other waivers on the, on the standards that um, ultimately then the, deep, then the applicant said, okay, we're going to propose this as a private way. And I think... Emerson was originally permitted a long time ago. Right? 2002. 2002. Yeah. Probably before most yeah. of anybody. Before, before we changed. I was here for that. Yeah, but most of us, I don't think any of the other were on the board. Okay. Um, 
Well, you know, uh, anything else from the board? Because we can hear from the public. Uh, so we're going to open up public comments. Before we do, um, you know, this is, I think, the third hearing on this. We know we're going to have another one. Um, so I'd like you, you know, we're going to come up to the podium, state your name and address, have your piece. Um, try not to repeat something that everybody else has said. You know, it's, it's already quarter of eight. We're going to try to move this along. You know, have your say, but um, um, we're going to be here again, you know, at another time. So, um, Karen, good one. City Councilor Marianne LaBarge. Um, I have to say there has been um, some improvement going on with communication um, with the abutters. Over by um, lot number 11, there's like two white blocks. Now, I think there is an agreement, if I'm not right or not, with Marsha and Jerry that that property, if this plan does go through, it would be theirs, correct? Yes, uh, there's, 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 there's an, agree yes, okay. there's an agreement the between the okay. questions to us and then we can reflect on okay. I'll respond to that. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So oh, I'm happy. You want to allow them to respond? Yes, please. There is an agreement with the property owners to provide some fencing and some other transfers, which is an agreement between them. It's contingent on approval, but if it's approved, the, I believe they're satisfied with those conditions. I mean, they signed the agreement. So to purchase lot 11? No, mm -hmm. not to purchase lot oh, I thought you just said yeah. the, the no. agreement is to purchase lot 11. No, the it's being that. given to them. It's being given to them. Right. Not the not no, a piece of land. A piece of land. Piece of land. Between, between 11 oh, and their okay. property. The way I heard you say it is they're yeah. getting yeah. lot 11. I think we all heard they're getting lot 11. I said beside yeah. lot 11. Oh, beside lot 11. Yes. Okay. It's Anyways, what? I'm very happy about okay. that because these are dire abutters, which the road is going to go between their home and Mrs. Brown's house. So I think that compromise is well deserved to go into Marsha and Jerry. Um, I'm very happy and pleased to hear about coming out of Glendale Road or coming into Glendale Road and the house directly across the street. Maybe somebody can answer this. I think I'm hearing about arborvitaes being placed in front of that house, what the size of those arborvitaes will be because I know cars coming out of there, the headlights are going to be directly to that house. So I'm hoping that they're like six feet and up because that's what's going to be needed. Um, I'm very concerned about lots one and two. I wouldn't buy those lots. Mm -hmm. If I can't work on my own property, I have a problem with that. And I'm hoping that this is really stressed to these people because I do know I'm having a problem right now on my ward on Austin Circle where they bought homes years ago. Now they're wetlands and they're being told they cannot work on their property. They have to go to conservation and get a special permit in order to work on their property. So I'm a little concerned about house number one and two of the amount of land that these people will have. Um, I'm glad to hear that there will be communication as far as um, a protocol. I think this is extremely valuable that this be placed for recommendations. Um, I also am very pleased when I stressed last time about West Hampton Road, about a bus shelter being placed in that site, and I said it was too dangerous. I'm glad that's being removed. Do I agree with this plan? I don't. In my heart, I think it's huge. I think 24 houses. I'm really concerned that I do have some residents on Glendale Road who are special needs and there's no sidewalks on that road, and I care about their quality of life. I'm also hearing about the city of Northampton, the Board of Public Works, saying that they do not ever and never will make that a city street. I can see why, because it is a high water level area of where they're talking about. Um, we can't stop the development, but I have to say, that the owner has been working very closely with the abutters, and that's important to me. I'm also hearing tonight about wildlife, that there will be trails for them. I disagree with that, 
I've seen so much development on my ward, and being told, oh yes, the wildlife is going to stay, they don't, okay? They have no place to go. They move on, and we don't see them anymore. I used to have deer in back of our yards. We don't have them anymore. I know on Glendale Road, I've seen turkeys there with Wayne Fiden on site looking at the property. I'm talking about 13 to 15 turkeys coming out of and back of Marsha's house crossing, a, crossing the street. Deers, bears, we have it out there. I, I'm just so concerned about the wildlife. <coughs> That's where my concerns are, okay? I also am a little concerned of hearing tonight about the traffic study that was done, that there was not a full-blown traffic study. Why not? We're looking at an intersection of Route 66, West Farms Road, and Glendale Road. Ever since they have reconstructed Route 66, it's, a, it's unbelievable. It's a racetrack out there. I'm very concerned about that intersection. So me as a counselor, I need proof that there will be safety at that intersection. Because even now where we live, like Frandy and I and that, we just had a huge accident in front of our house, knocked down trees and everything. It's like I'm concerned about that intersection and why it's not being mandatory of a full-blown traffic study. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I looked at the plants. The, um, the trees the, um, are six to eight feet there uh, from the plants. Across. Oh, oh, sorry. Gentleman in the back, actually, who you were almost first last time. My name is Al Champagne, 1194 West Hampton Road. I have a couple questions. First of all, if this is a private road, when it's plowed, where's the snow going? Can't push it out on 66 or Glendale. So what happens then? And also, on the uh, uh, homeowners association, what happens when you only have a partial of these lots occupied? Who pays if they have to have anything repaired? You're going to have four or five families doing it? How does that work? But, uh, so actually, I've turned uh, two of the questions around. I know in other associations, the developer is often responsible until you get a critical mass of. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure if you guys have a number when the association takes over. Is it after the 20th lot, after the 15th? Yeah, we, sub we, submitted, we submitted a draft uh, covenants in that. I mean, it has to be revised because you're switching to a private road now. Right. I, there's there's a number in there yeah. after which right. the, yes. there, there's yes. certain thre there's a threshold where the, the association takes yeah. over. About the snowplow. My guess is, you know, we plowed along the side of the street just like it would be anyway. But you can't push it out onto the public roads. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Just can't like do that in the driveway in Northampton? Pardon? Can't do that in the driveway. No, you can't push yeah, it out. Right. You can't push it out in the street. Right. But no. when you're plowing to the intersection, you have to plow that snow someplace. So. Yep. Right. So, uh, yeah. Marsha Fellows, 123 Glendale Road. Um, I've been in close contact with Steve. He's been very kind to us. Um, the drainage scares me. If anybody has gone out and seen the markings, have you all gone out and seen, you see where our driveway is 10 feet away, and of course the snow would be plowed on either side or Meg's or our property. That's where the snow would go. The drainage scares me. I, I heard them. There was three different concepts. If you see in front of my house, I have a huge puddle that everybody hits and the water goes <coughs> over the fence. Mm -hmm. Where the new uh, school bus stop is going to be, it puddles there. There's a gigantic puddle. So if you notice the road, is you have to peek it. It goes, all right, so on the side I'm going to have the rainwater and and in front, I have tremendous puddle, enough where I had to build the driveway up because it was washing it out. So when we have a quick downpour, all that water puddles there. And listening to his drainage mm -hmm. and upkeep of this road, I may be flooded out where I never was before. I've never had a drop of water in my basement. But where's that water going to go? It, it sounds so unclear about the drainage 
and I've asked the D, uh, Department of Public Works to do something with it, the frontage of my house, and when they resurfaced the driveway, they just went over a big hole, and so it, it's a, a massive amount of water. If you ever go after a rainstorm, you'd see how much water, where it just washes over the fence. And now you're taking away the one area the water runs to. And if no one maintains, if something breaks down, I, we're going to have on both sides of us water coming in that we never had before. So Mr. Wilner has agreed to fix the drainage in front of my house, but you're taking away places where it would be able to soak into. So that's my problem now is the drainage. I mean, I had multiple problems uh, with the development, but, you know, I've been offered all these things, but it's not worth it if I'm going to lose usage of my property because it's too wet. Uh, three feet from our shed, there's a big puddle, and it actually runs into his property because it has no place else to go because it's coming off my property. It's, my rainwater is going someplace, and yeah, it's going on his property. I approached him. I showed him. He said, yeah, he'd fix it. But, boy, I'm not sure what your drainage is going to be, and, and if these curbings break down, that's going to be beside our houses. It's going to look terrible. And if no one's maintaining it, because one, they may not have the money to, and what would get fixed first, the pipe or the curbing or the landscaping? So thusly, that area between my neighbor and myself could look pretty trashy come 30 years. Thank you. You guys want to respond to the sure. drainage? Uh, the, the curbing at this area where Marsha was speaking of will, will be granite curbing as per uh, Northampton standards. Uh, the drainage in front of our house, Mr. Wilner has offered to uh, fix that. All, all the water from the roadway along here is going to be going into an underground piping system. And eventually it's going to pipe down and end up into our detention basin. So n none of the water from our development is going to leave uh, from the roadway and go out onto Glendale. We're capturing it all and dumping it into our basin. So I, I don't see the drainage, at least for our roadway and for the front, um, being, being an issue. If there are, are drainage problems on her property now in the rear, uh, you know, we, we can't really help that. But roadway-wise and, and in front next to her driveway, we, we offer to uh, fix that. So. Just a little elaboration, Edward Etheridge of Northampton. Um, the lot uh, that uh, Councilor Labarge was referring to is 10, not 11, which is where Marcia and Geraldine live. Is that, that's correct, correct, I think, right? And, 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 and we did work out an agreement with them, which they signed in support for their support of the project, which we would deal with that drainage, deed them a strip of land, cut down some trees they want cut down, plant some additional trees, and install a fence. So we have a very detailed and specific agreement with them for their support of the project, which does address those. As Peter said, the drainage there uh, from the road, the water's not going to turn around and flow uphill to their house. Uh, their water is still going to come to the roadway, and now we're going to have to deal with it comes it comes on to the property of, of this development. But they have plans under the stormwater management to deal with the, the drainage from their property. So there are a number of other things that, that mitigate it there. The uh, other issue was, uh, Councilor Barge had talked to both Peter Wells and me, not only several times today, but even tonight. Um, the properties b uh, along where the septic and the uh, drainage ditch are, you can see there's a path that, to give access down to there, um, which is for repair and servicing. But it's possible it would be used by people to access the open space or for other rings. And the neighbor who lives down there is concerned that people would then um, once they're in that open area, come on to her property uh, there. So she's requested some fencing along there. We're agreeable to some type of fencing uh, that would keep people from going on. We just remind the board, you, you know, you can't serve all masters here. That's going to cut off wildlife um, access when you put in a fence there that would keep people out. So it's sort of a question of, 
you want the turkeys walking in your yard or you want the turkeys walking in your yard. <laughs> but anyway, as we, we're, we're perfectly amenable to some condition that the board would think appropriate or that we can work out with the neighbors. A fence is not an issue. I just bring it to the board's attention, which you probably would have paid attention to anyway. But, but that is the issue. We don't have a problem with that. Uh, as far as the association goes, um, there is a draft association filed already. You're correct. The developer retains control and responsibility till, until a certain point um, in terms of number of lot sales. Association has to be formed. They are all over the city. There are fewer in terms of subdivision associations, but there are more in terms of condominium associations. Um, there, for all the various projects, Bear Hill has an association. To, to be responsible for certain, ICE Bond has an association. Uh, not only are they responsible for certain things, but they have certain rules. I remember after ICE Bond started, somebody was parking a tractor trailer up there, which of course was not allowed under the regulations, but they had a procedure by which the managers could take care of that. Someone wanted to put in a pool. They had to get permission for their fence and their pool because that's in the association document. So I think the people who live in these places, they're, they're I don't want to say they're relatively new because they existed for centuries uh, in common scheme developments, but they've become much more complicated these days. But people are getting accustomed to them as they're getting accustomed to condominiums. Uh, and some people take them very seriously. I attended a number of meetings at the Ice Pond Association um, when they were trying to sort out how to enforce their regulations and their fees and how they worked, and I think they've gotten a real good hand up there. It is part of being a community. I mean, that's one of the things you're discussing here, is at what point do you leave the community by saying, we're not going to be responsible for streets, we're starting to make everything private. You, you start to lose the idea of community when you do that and put everything on everybody else. I, I know it's become an issue in Florida in land use management, where all the subdivisions become gated communities that people hide behind their gates and everything is private, and not only does it raise issues about whether you're a community anymore, but it raises tax issues because those people have come to the assessors in Florida with a number of cases which said what are typically municipal services are not provided to these homes. Uh, so their tax valuation is significantly impacted as a result of that. So it has impacts when you begin to go down that road. Um, may take burden off of city services one place, but you pay for it elsewhere both in terms of a society and in terms of tax revenues and other things. The reason we don't have a waiver for private OSR is because this was a subdivision <laughs> until the city said it wouldn't take the street. We needed a special permit. But once the city says you don't need a street, you then have to file the waivers to do that. But this is a recent turn of events. I will work that out with the planning department. We'll come to closure on those rates. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, Mimi Rogers, 97 Glendale Road. A um, couple things I want to touch on, but I do just want to address the thing with the private ways. I, I attend every Board of Public Works meeting, so I know that this is a really serious issue for the city. And as a matter of fact, there are tons of streets right now that actually are private ways that the city have been plowing for years. And then it's a matter of does the city have the street, does it not? And it's going to be a huge undertaking on the part of the city to actually determine if they are, then the cost of applying for it, and the cost of all the different regulations that the city's going to have to go through. And it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's a huge mess. And ask a member of the Board of Public Works about it. They'll give you an earful. But the point is, I can understand why they're gun-shy to want to accept any road. And to be very specific, right now, we're not going to accept any road in the future. They, I think that because this has kind of blindsided them from many, many years in the past of all these roads that are actually private ways that they've been taken care of, and it's a mess. But I just wanted to point that out, that that might be one of the reasons why they're beyond the water, that they're just a little, like, being very definitive because for future purposes. Um, my other concern is the road that's going to come out onto Glendale Road. And I'm not sure what, how the traffic study goes. I, I mean, I walk by where I see it marked off, and it just, to me, as a layperson, seems very narrow. Um, Glendale Road has a large traffic of cyclists, believe it or not, who go riding there on the weekdays and on the weekends, and they are like bunches. You know, it's not just one or two, but it's like, you know, a group of cyclists out there. And I just see how that road comes out, and to me it seems like a car would, you know, not, 
I, I get concerned about how that would be an impact. So I would recommend, I mean, if there's some sort of a study on that, but also the fact that there are no sidewalks. I mean, I walk on Glendale Road, and it's, to me, it's more narrow. I'm much happier getting down to Route 66 because it's wider, there's a bike lane, there's, it's more comfortable, you know, as, as safe as you can feel with people zipping by. But um, it makes me concerned the way that that road comes out. It just, you know, it's, people come out of their driveways much slower. They creep out because it's your driveway. But when it's a road and you're coming up, if you're doing 20, you know, or 25 miles and you're coming up, you know, you might not stop. And, you know, I know you have a stop sign there, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about it. Just because I walk there, my daughter walks there, people are cycling, little kids are riding their bikes, elderly people are riding their bikes, walking. So I am somewhat concerned about that. Um, I don't know if they're going to definitely do the traffic study or not, but I did want to weigh in on that. So thank you. Uh, there was a woman. Uh, Brigitte Holt, and I'm on 126 Glendale Road, um, and um, I have a, a question and, and, a, and a comment. Uh, so my house is would be a little square that you had in your other uh, map behind the arborvitae uh, that uh, that you've addressed, and I wanted to thank the project for considering my request to give uh, some shelter uh, between the headlights that are going to go right into my uh, living room. And well, the question I had about that is when I'm looking at that, it may just be the effect that this is just, a, 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 you know, a, a, you're just kind of doing the, the little green trees there. But from what I'm understanding about the way the road is relative to my house, it looks as though those trees are almost in front of my driveway, um, and which would not be good for me to pull out of my driveway. But uh, my point is this, is I, what I'm thinking is that since it's going to be a fairly dark area, cars are going to come out, and they're going to have their brights in, and you know the, the brights of their cars. And so I want to make sure that those trees are extending really well in front of that road, and so that it's really going to shelter um, my, uh, my house well you know, away from those uh, from those headlights. So I'm not quite sure how that's how sure. that's planned. Yeah, uh, yeah. Quite an, you, you can respond. Uh, the only thing about the I'm looking at the plan, and you guys keep saying arborvitae, but the plan say Canadian hemlock. I don't know if that's a, an issue. Yeah, but that's what the plan say. But if she wants arborvitae, we can put in ar arborvitae. Okay, you just might want to make the amendment. Yeah, and in terms of the ac actual location on where where those get planted, what we can do is when the plants are delivered, we'll work with you and we'll, we'll hand place okay, them super. and we'll put them in so that we can visually see that it is going to, right, so yeah. we'll make note of that. Yeah, regard, I remember we had a conversation this summer about the hemlock versus hybrid and I, I, get, I think it's, I don't know. I'm yeah. Personal choice. Mm -hmm. We can talk talk more. I about just that wondered too. if there was no, an I issue of uh, no. I think there was an issue of also um, uh, maybe this was where the conversation went in about salt from the roads, from the plows, and some trees are more sensitive to that. And I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. So if you guys want, to, whatever you guys want to agree and you put on the plans, right. that that would be fine Wait. with us. Okay. Okay. And. No, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> he, he has this thing about our bikes. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would leave it up to the home owner. <laughs> Well, maybe we should, we should talk. Maybe I need some education. Anyway, uh, we have a, we have an arborist on the street. I'll consult. Okay. Uh, and the comment I had was uh, was actually echoing some of the things that Marion Lavarge uh, said. Um, it's about the uh, environmental um, impact uh, study that was done. And all I wanted to say is that. Uh, we don't just have wildlife there. I mean, wildlife can be squirrels. Uh, that's what people have in cities. We have those too. But we have things like bobcats. Uh, we have deer. We have turkey. Uh, bobcats are really precious. They're, they're rare. Uh, we have foxes. Uh, we, we have wildlife, real nice wildlife. We have bears. Some people may not like those. I think they're great. Marsha and Julie think they're great. And so um, to say, uh, and I understand that uh, it is very obvious that it is going to change the character of the wildlife. So when they do an impact statement, I don't know what that company did as an impact statement and uh, um, in environmental impact study, what criteria they used. But I don't think we should just and we should just accept that the developments, you know, is probably going to happen. It is going to change the wildlife. But I, we shouldn't, you know, the project shouldn't hide behind uh, a statement like there will be no impact on the wildlife right. to sort of to appease your conscience, because that is simply nonsense. Thank you. I'm Amy Hollick Dunn from 183 Glendale Road. 
And I am probably echoing a lot of what others have said. Um, Peter mentioned in his remarks that there is no rare wildlife and the corridors won't be impacted. And Mo and I were just comparing notes. Um, you know, we've lived there our whole lives, and we never saw the level of wildlife that's there now because it's all been forced down off of Mineral Hills with the development up there. So there is a lot more wildlife. There are deer. There's my mom's flock of turkeys that <laughs> come through her yard every, every day. So they, the wildlife certainly does exist, and, and we certainly want to protect that. Um, I do have concerns about the traffic study. After 40 years, we're finally, finally getting about to get rid of all the dump traffic, and now we're going to have new cut-through traffic. So um, I think the neighborhood is very concerned about the, the impact of traffic on the, the way this will create a cut-through. Um, and I do want to, we're the, the homeowners that uh, had the mention of the, the fence, and I do, I do want to clarify that that's as much a property line delineation as anything, because when the perk tests were initially done for this property, they were done on our property. So we want to be absolutely sure that there is a delineation of the property line, a very clear delineation, and some sort of fence to keep the turkeys and the turkeys out. Um, and my final, my final um, comment is about the DPW being reluctant to take over the road due to the high water table. I am concerned about that water retention area and what that might do to force moisture into what is a pretty dry area on, on our property. Um, when Glendale Road was repaved, it created a huge puddle that's really a terrible hazard for my 85-year-old mom. Um, at the end of her driveway, and I'm concerned about, as Marcia mentioned too, the, the amount of water that's going to be running off of this site. So I just want to be absolutely sure that, that the, the water retention area is um, not forcing water onto property that has previously not had a, a water problem. Thank you. You want to respond to that at all? About the uh, I guess the question was making sure that the water is not, you know, water right. Water yeah, I guess uh, as far as the water, again, the water that falls on the site today is going to be the same as it is tomorrow. So the rainfall is going to be essentially the same. We're not going to generate more total rain runoff or total, total additional water. And we sort of have tried to emulate the existing drainage patterns and the location of the detention basin. They say detention retention basin. And that detention basin essentially fills up and drains out and goes down to the stream as it currently, water currently does. So we're not really taking water and shifting it over to the east. We're essentially maintaining the water. Actually, if anything else, we're taking water from the Lindell area and shifting it towards the west a little bit. So we're actually taking water away from that location and draining it down towards near the um, brook. And that's at a lower elevation than the Glendale area, Glendale Road area. Thank you. My name is Maureen Bowler, and I'm representing 165 Glendale Road. And I have just a few questions. Um, my uh, first question is if somebody could give us an idea of what type of uh, price range these houses are going for. Excuse me, I mean, it's nothing, it doesn't, there's no impact on our permit with the prices. So. Do they have garages? Uh, again, it's, not if they don't have garages, where would people be putting their um, snowmobiles and boats and all this? I, I'm getting to the point that th this is a project, and I know it looks, you know, it's pretty cute now, but I'm just trying to um, get to the fact that we're a rural area, and um, to me, this cluster of homes, um, I think if there's any way that the city can downsize this in any possibility, um, so I'm requesting that you vote no on your variances and waivers, um, if at all possible, and try and limit the scope of this project so that it could shrink a bit. Um, if they don't have garages, maybe make them homes with garages so people could put their boats and snowmobiles in such a way so that it would continue to look nice. Um, I'm also concerned, too, about the homeowners association, because um, I'm understanding then, too, that they would be required to take care of that retention holding tank, as well as the um, communal septic leach field. Is that true? Um, so then my concern is, as with others on some of the association, is 
Um, if we end up with issues, because that's the end I'm coming in at, um, with issues with the septic s system, is the city, the city sounds like it's kind of washing their hands of all of this and we'd be working with the association to resolve these problems. Um, okay. Um, so I, nobody will even give me, just to satisfy my curiosity on a price range. Are we talking $300,000 homes here? It's, it's, you could ask me whether or not you've got I mean, it might not be relevant. I'm curious. At this, at this point, we're, we're looking at it in the low 300s, yes. Okay. And would it be horrible if somebody shared with me if there's having garages? We anticipate okay. having garages okay. in the homes, yes. Thank you. Whether they stay garages afterwards or not, you know. Well, you're right. That's a whole other thing. Um, but I guess we'd take that up with the Homeowners Association then? So a question for you is, um, what happens if the Homeowners Association doesn't have the funds to maintain the roads and the sidewalk and the drainage things and the catch water basin and the septic system? What then happens? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ed, thank you. Um, just to assure you, even though it's an association, if you have a septic system, the Board of Health always has a jurisdiction over it. It has to be functioning, it has to work. And if it's not functioning, the people have to move out of their house because they're not inhabitable. But it's not like you've deferred, you lose all of your control. You still have quite a lot of control. And if you put water somewhere else, the drainage doesn't work, as all the engineers and the city has viewed it does. If water's flowing somewhere else, that's a trespass. You not only have private actions uh, against the association, but um, you could look to uh, the Conservation Commission for how that's been redirected or whatever. <coughs> I mean, just because a private road doesn't mean the city, it hasn't become a private country. The septic system is still under the jurisdiction of the Board of Health. Right, but the city would never go in and fix it. The city would not go in and fix it, no, but the homeowners wouldn't be able to live in their houses if it doesn't work. I think that might bring them to the table. <laughs> And then I was a little confused, the meeting that was in June, um, the last meeting, um, I thought uh, that there was no traffic study, that in lieu of a traffic study, there was some money transpiring to the city. I, I remember somebody saying it was very complicated. Has something changed on that? Or was there, it made it sound like now there was a traffic study done. Not a full there are two, there's always a traffic mitigation requirement for whatever project, residential, commercial, in the city, unless you're in certain districts, is defined in the, in the ordinances. So traffic mitigation it, it is required regardless of whether a full traffic study is done. The issue is, you know, traffic study, a, a full-blown traffic study will tell you from at point A to point Z where the projected um, trips are going to be um, going in and out of the subdivision. We have a pretty standard idea for single family homes about where, um, how many trips are generated from a single family home. Um, and this is a relatively small subdivision um, and, and construction project. So it's not, there's, um, it, there, it doesn't really necessitate a complicated um, traffic study. The trips are gonna be distributed um, generally because there's an, um, it's not a dead-end street, so there's um, a way for trips to sort of go out both entrances or either entrance. So um, that, that was really the issue is the need and what you would gain by spending um, time on evaluating um, traffic relative to the answers you get. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty small project as compared to a large retail project on King Street or, or a much bigger um, Well, again, we're, we're rural, so to me this is a huge, yes. it may be a small for some people, but to, it's too huge to a lot of us out 
um, on Glendale Road and Route 66. I just want to go on record that I'm extremely concerned, traffic study or no traffic study, two particular areas coming down what we would call Kings Hill, so coming from West Hampton, Huntington, down the major hill. Um, that's a major truck route and everything. It's a major, major highway now. Um, those trucks are going to be coming down there, which they do, um, and they're going to come around the corner. Whether there's footage there or not, I think that's going to be a very, very bad area um, for traffic. And um, with the trees and the arborvitaes and the fencing and such coming out on Glendale Road, and uh, I, I believe me, I feel I, people need to do what they need to do to protect you know, lights and everything coming in, but I, I'm, af I'm afraid, I'm giving my best guess at looking at this visually, um, but it, that might not be the easiest peek out of that area too with fencing and arborvitaes there and such too. So I just want to go on record that I'm very concerned about the traffic coming down Kings Hill in particular and both in both directions on Glendale Road. Um, so in closing, um, I'm glad people did mention the animals um, because even though the, the, I guess the conservation area said there is none, there, we all know that there is. So um, I'm glad people are at least thinking about that because we're not downtown. We, we went out in this area um, for the rural life of Northampton. Um, and having lived there for 52 years before the dump and the whole nine yards, um, this um, you know, it had a potential of being a really great area of town as well, too. It's, it's the sense of your Sylvester Roads and Kennedy Roads and such before all this development um, went down. So I thank you for your time, and I would um, hope that you would consider limiting the scope of this project as much as you can, which would minimize the impact on all of us. Um, so please do not grant any extra waivers if you don't have to or variances and um, maybe we could get the 24 units down to 18 or even 15 which would be in my ideas still large for the area but um, less of an impact on us. So thank you. My name is Blake Simmons, 1095 West Hampton Road. <clears throat> um, we've only been there about five years, but we live, you know, at the top part of the curb where the green meets the road and stuff like that. We, in the past, we just lived through the 66 project, so we're the ones that inherited a 12,000 square foot swamp in our front yard. Um, so my biggest concern is water. I mean, there's no, we own actually that white part, part of the triangle on this side of the road. So we're, you know, I, I, drive the tractor through there, I mow it, I, uh, you know, I haven't farmed in the past, but we, you know, we tend to keep turning it over and planting stuff there and stuff like that, but we already have standing water. I mean, we have three feet of water on the other side of the street. I mean, there's no, you can't tell me that the water's not there. Um, it all comes into our front yard and then drains across the street. And I can tell you that everybody around there has sump pumps, everybody. I mean, I, I can tell you multiple times, just, you know, how about... October 31st snowstorm, we lost power for five days. I went to every single one of my neighbors. I have about two or three generators, and I can tell you right now, I spent more time driving around, pumping out people's basements, to help my neighbors from flooding out, than, than I, you know, I think I'd spend at work that week. Because the water is just, it's unrelenting. Um, I've gone through sump pumps, I've bought you know, the best sump pumps, so my biggest thing is water. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is, right across the street where it comes on at 66, there's a guy there named Mr. Doyle. Really nice guy, elderly guy. We're talking about where you're going to push the snow. The guy already can't see out of his driveway. He's, him and his wife have already gotten almost hit a, numerous times. So that's an unbelievably dangerous curve. They widened the road. They made it. It's supposedly 25 miles an hour. It's, it's like a super highway. People come off the curve. They stomp on it. Sports cars, motorcycles, logging trucks. I mean, just go there and hang out. Go in my yard, sit in the driveway, and just watch for a little while, see what happens. Um, there's been two very serious accidents in the past year alone up on top of the hill. Where I mean, this, walk, this road is 40 feet wide, and these people are coming down the hill. There should be no reason they should run into each other. And there's been two serious accidents. One just happened less than a month ago. Um, so. I can't imagine letting people enter, in, enter onto the road right there. I just, it just does, doesn't make any sense. But, I mean, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But I can't, uh, you know, and, and the next thing is, lots one and two. <clears throat> you know, they're going to be so small. You're going to put a house in there. They're going to have no land. You know, and then never mind that. Where, like, my, again, where's all the water going to go? It's going to, my fear is it's going to keep filling up my land. 
my fear is instead of me having an, an area 100 feet wide by two or you know two or three feet deep, it's going to be 200 feet wide, and it's going to be four feet deep in the middle of my field. And I'm going to have a pond in front of me, and I'm going to have a pond across the street, which what does it do? It just makes more water problems for me. So, um, I, I mean, I think I think that's really it. My my biggest concern is water and the traffic. And you know, I don't know how much time has everyone spent up there. And the next thing is, take it from me, I've been outside a lot. I, I, I I'm outside a lot with my dogs across the street. The wildlife. I mean, you just, you know, you laugh. You know, we all laugh about the turkeys and stuff, but we've counted 40 turkeys in our side yard, and they all come from my yard, and they come right over to the dump, and they all make their way. Um, bobcats. I've never seen bobcats before in my life. In the past five years, I've seen you know 10, 15, 20 times. Just this past week, we're all sitting there on a Saturday afternoon, no rhyme or reason, a bobcat walks through our front yard. You know, so the deer, you know, the deer, the, the moose, the whole nine yards, they're, they're, it's all there. So. Um, you know, I, I just see there's a lot of lots being slammed into there. Never mind the fact, I'll go into the fact that I own land up on top of the hill that I'm trying to sell for building lots right now, and I made mine. We made them four and a half acres, 4.3 and 3.9 acres. I could have went here and did exactly what they're trying to do, slam a bunch of homes in a small area, walk out of here, and never look back. But, you know, I live there, and I, want, I, I don't want it to look, you know, I, I don't want it to look like that, but, I mean, if they do it by the rules and you guys allow them to do it, that's what it's going to end up looking like. So, um... That's really my main concerns. Thanks. Hey. Uh, oh, sorry. You're next, sir. Sorry. Uh, first, I want to thank all my neighbors for everything. Sorry, thing. your name address? Uh, Jim O'Dell, 109 Glendale. I want to thank everybody for their concerns and everything because I agree with everybody in here. Uh, my property is that big rectangle of a white one up at the top right. The reason why we moved there was because of the wildlife and the privacy. And hopefully this isn't going to impede with the wildlife. I had 60 turkeys in my yard this morning and it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's the best thing you've ever seen. Uh, deer, bobcats, everything. Hopefully this doesn't impede with the wildlife because they're, they're gorgeous. Privacy, if this does go in, I want to make a formal request to get a, a fence like you're going to offer my neighbor here along the, the two edges of the rectangle, I'm asking for some kind of privacy fence, some uh, uh, split, split, I don't know, doesn't have to be stockade or anything like that, just some kind of uh, fencing that keeps the human turkeys out of our yards. Hi, Meg Brown, 137 Glendale. Um, I'm the house to the south of the, where the road is, and I, I really still am very concerned about cars coming down, and that's right where we park our cars, right on that corner right there. And I'm very concerned that um, someone's just going to turn the car right into our driveway all the time. It's just going to be, might as well not even be a driveway there because it's just going to be a cutoff. And that's where we park. And so, say someone puts up a fence, I'm also concerned if it's private. What if we don't see a car coming and it crashes into the fence? And I mean, it sounds silly, but it was in the paper yesterday. Somebody's. I'm sorry, which fence are you talking about? If there was a fence between my yard and the road, and a car came in, we wouldn't be able to get out of the way because we wouldn't know it was there. We wouldn't know it was coming. If there was a fence up. Here? Yes, if there was a, f no, to, Here. yes. If there was a fence there for privacy, which it probably should be, but if a car comes down the street, we're not going to be able to get out of the way to, if we, if we see, don't see the car coming. And I have two kids and a dog and my husband and me, and we don't want to get killed. And we're, I'm really scared that the driveway is just, just uh, not going to be our driveway anymore. What are we supposed to do? Lynn Simmons, uh, 1095 West Hampton Road. And I just have a couple questions. Um, I'm assuming all these homes are going to be built with sump pumps because the groundwater is so high. And I want to know where they're going to drain, like if the drainage is going to be built into the drainage that's proposed so that they're not draining onto the lots or the neighbor's lots or the open space that's there just because the water is such an issue. 
Um, and then I want to know if there's going to be public access to the open space, and if so, where it's going to be and where any proposed parking is for it. Um, already when the development was being permitted, or not permitted, but the plans were being drawn up, everyone was parking um, on our property because it was the straightest shot in. It was the safest place to park. So we would repeatedly go out there and just say what, you know, what's going on, making sure they weren't hunters because our properties posted no hunting. Um, and I want to make sure that the public isn't doing the same thing because I don't want to be liable if somebody gets hurt or trips and falls or whatever. Um, so I want to make sure that that's taken into account if there is public access to that open space. And I want to know if this project is approved, when it will be breaking ground, just so we can have some expectation of, you know, when that would be happening. Um, and if the same developer is going to be used for all the lots just to uh, ensure that they're all built to the same standard. Um, so a couple questions. I think we, you guys addressed the drainage. The, if some pumps are all draining into, you're not, you're not blowing water out into other people's lawns. Correct. They're going into the same the water system that's going to drain into the retention pond. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, the next question about the public asset access and parking. To the open space that's proposed. Because if I'm not, uh, I could be wrong, but the ridge had some trails that were proposed, and they were supposed to meet up with this development, possibly. So if people are using that to, and the other thing is there's a, anticipating that there will be over the years the public is going to want to access that because with all the water there used to be a, a very large stream that actually used to pool and get pretty deep because I used to swim there when I was a kid mm -hmm. and I'm anticipating that once other people find that out that it will happen again it hasn't been nearly as um, filled because of some things that neighbors have done um, filled with water I should say but once all these homes get in there and the water starts getting displaced, I can see it filling up again. Or in, you know, lots of rain, like we've experienced um, in the past few years. So I just, I can see people parking either on the street, which would be fine because it wouldn't impact me, but when they park on West Hampton Road or they park on Glendale Road, it's going to impact people that don't live on that subdivision. Thanks. Thank Anybody else? Okay. Um, so we also have um, 
Carolyn handed this out at the beginning of the meeting. Um, do I have to read all 22 no, of these? No, because a lot of these are issues that you can go to the bank that need to, because we have to continue anyway, so right. it can go away. I mean, there were some questions that I noted um, that I don't think have been clarified. Um, and I wonder, so I can go through those. Um, one is, um, which actually relates to the trails on one of the original plans. There showed a path network by lot 24 and lot 1, and I don't know if that's still planned or if that's generally just going to be left open. Um, yeah, through there. So, so essentially, you could do a loop through the open space. If you lived in that neighborhood, you could. The problem is the wetlands. You'd be crossing wetlands. This is all wetland here. Yeah. So, no, that's just going to remain open space, green space. Um, and then the easement area, I know there had been a question early on about whether that would meet the standard um, for multi um, use sort of off-road trail of um, not exceeding 8.1%. And so I don't know if you did the calculations. Oh, the on the trail down here? Yeah. Uh, yes, we can meander a trail up there that will... Within uh, that 30-foot wide path that you're showing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Have they seen the rest of these? The, 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 uh, no, I didn't send them out. Um, all right, so to the board, um, just so that the applicant has all information from us that they need, because we're going to continue this, um, are there any other issues that we have uh, that you'd like to raise now um, for the applicant? I think we've heard, um, I'm not sure how, how much of this goes on the plans, these, these Agreeing these side agreements they have with the abutters, do those have to go on the plans or do they have to show well, those to us? It's up to you. I mean, there's two ways that you could um, analyze that or review it. If, if um, you know, there's a special permit to consider which is um, has different criteria than the subdivision. So the special permit for the cluster um, has to um, address impacts to um, the abutting properties and, and property owners. So I think the only way that these side agreements can be enforced is if they become conditions. So mm -hmm. if, um, if that is important to the approval for this cluster, then I would say you would want to see the specific um, language so that then they can be conditions. Um, and you know, you could, the applicant could draft those and present them and then just have them incorporated as conditions. I think that's the cleanest way. Um, the other issues uh, that have come up, um, I think we, you're all going to resolve the issue about the curbing, the tumulus versus granite. Um, what other issues have come up that we want to raise? Does anybody else have anything else you want to bring up? I was, I was going to mention the design needs for the access to the open space. Is there a required time? I mean, Typically, that's yeah. standard that, yeah. you know, particularly in between the lots. I just that, don't want them to be surprised by that. Right. That, that's you, pretty You don't standard. want who to be surprised by that? The developers. The oh. lot owners as well. Yeah, the lot owners. Right. right. So 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 4 and 5. Well, 4 and 5 is not going to be a path. But it's open space, so it would be available for, I mean, even if there's not the <clears> path for, you know, a path could potentially. Right. Yeah, it's Cardinal Way. Cardinal Way has that. Has yeah. signage on all oh. six yeah. of the seven places. Yep. It's standard for all the cluster open space developments. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, lighting, there are no street lights along the street, I think. They've asked for a waiver. So. Right, so there's the waivers because they don't want. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing. Just at the entrance. Right, where, where, the, where the bus, control. yeah, right there. Not on West Gantry Road, though, just, <coughs> just, just by the bus shelter, not on West Gantry Road. Correct. Uh, certainly, a good point was made about visibility when you're coming out of the, on the road onto Glendale Road. Right. The fence and the privacy stuff should not extend up to the road. 
Yeah, you have to meet certain sites to try. Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to be reassured. That right, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I think you bought. I'm not sure if she's still here, but the, the fence that they're putting in next to there is not going to go right up to the street. So if you're coming out the driveway, the, the, the fences can't go right up to the street. So this, there will be a sight line. I think. In other words, it won't be like the access to the landfill, which is. Well, the snow is—it's illegal. They can't push the snow onto Glendale Road yeah. or the West Hampton Road. That's—that's yeah. that's just that would be no matter who owned the road. That would be yeah. nothing easy. to do about the wildlife. Yeah. I don't know. I lived on Pomeroy Terrace before those bears found. Yeah, yeah, nobody mentioned bears. Yeah. Oh, they're there. It's a bear trail. Um, okay, so because uh, we're gonna have to continue this, any other things we want to ask? I don't know if we had. I forget where we left off. On we usually we traditionally put bollards or something up to indicate where the person's property ends and the open space. The, um, Right. We talked about this in the past. Where, in fact, what was the last? I can't remember. The last we had all these land, all these hospital hill, hospital hospital hill. all these lots border up against conservation land. What happens over time is people will say, "Oh, right. it's going to go five feet forward, five feet more, yeah, five yeah. feet more." Right. I mean, I'm particularly worried about one and two. I don't know how steep the berm is. They might store their snowmobiles right. right. It would have to be safe <laughs> for people to be deterred. I think. Right. So I think I think what we've done in the past is we've either we've used concrete markers, we use We've used boulders, we've used split rail fences, but some way to delineate that you are at the end of your lot, you cannot mow, put up your swing set. We're going to have a, a two to three foot high berm there, an earth berm, that will delineate where the conservation area is, and, and we could also add um, signage there. Well, that's along with that. Two, but we're talking also 17.4, yeah, five, five, oh. five through all the way. Five, back. Every one of those oh. lots, the back of the butts up into the conservation uh -huh. area. I actually think that is some way of trying to control the wildlife issue a little bit because it's just keeping that open space actually open. Right. So. Right. And the idea, the worry is that over time people creep into those areas. They mow farther, mm -hmm. they start fertilizing it, you know, they want to do something. So in the past, we've had various ways that. We don't have a standard. It's not split rail fence, it's not bollards, it's not concrete pillars. We've allowed the developers to decide how they want to delineate so that the homeowners aren't going to be encroaching upon them. So I think that's something. But more than a bird, I mean, a bird. I think the, right. the issue is really more significant where there's a wetland buffer as opposed to just the open space area. I mean, yes, it would be encroachment, ultimately, you know, they have a property pin. Delineation and, and so um, there, there's some self enforcement there. I think the, the bigger issue is, is really along, I would say, is along the wetland. So you oh. might just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. but, but if Randy, Mark, and Ed, I think the problem is just as great on the open space. That you have to keep people from encroaching into the open space, whether it's a wetland or not. Mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty important issue. Or, I thought relatively recently. Uh, with some flag lots off of 66, I forget which um, uh, project it was, but it was just an open space issue in their backyard, and we made them, I think they had granite markers. Not oh, a fence or anything, but yeah. you know, granite markers, because we were concerned. It wasn't a wetland or issue, um, but it was just open space. We were just worried about creep. Yeah, yeah I think the important ones are, are lots one and two, where we'd have to protect the wetland. Uh, a simple delineation and the other ones granite markers would be, you know, just setting in some old granite curve or something would be fantastic. My experience is in general, people actually mow and cut down trees less than they particularly need to, rather than like careering off into the hinterland to clearing that space. Is, um, yeah. Well, so I think, well, I mean, I, lots one and two are going to have a berm. I'm not sure how high the berm is, but I think the berm is, the, lots one and two are the ones I worry about the least because you have to go up and over a berm in order to get to that. It's, it's the rest of them where I worry about the creep. So you know, I would like to see something, some indication. It could be a marker, it could be some indication that says you have reached the end of what you are. Why don't we 
scratch our heads and come up with, with an option or two on uh, next meeting. That's, that's perfect. That, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's I have one quick question. I know we saw a cross section, but I, I can't remember. Are there sidewalks, or is it just yes? Sidewalks there's a concrete sidewalk <laughs> that runs the entire length. Right. Thanks. That's all I want. So we have to pick a date um, to move to to our two. So do they need? Uh, yeah. Do you guys need two weeks, four weeks? We're talking. We're talking. Sometime in April. Yeah, April, I think, I don't know if we have anything. First meeting would be the 12th, I think. 12th? 12th and 26th. 12th and 26th. 26th would be great. All right, so uh, we're going to leave the public meeting open, which means there'll be public comment allowed at the next meeting as well. Um, so we need a motion to continue this to the 26th at 7 p.m. What would be the first one? Carol? First one? Second? Yeah. Okay. Cool. And move, please. I'll be. I can't vote on this. Yeah. Are you going to vote on this? I'll I think Franny made the motion. Just give a second. All right. So the motion is to move, uh, to continue to April 26th at 7 p.m. All in favor? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, and just so everybody's aware, you know, and because we're continuing this, members of the playing board can't discuss this outside of the room. So if you happen to see one of us on the street, you can't we can't talk about it, and we all know we can't talk among ourselves outside of the room. So, thank you. Hand signals, nothing. Brownies, can't give us cookies. <laughs>
what's concerning me now because I've made one today. <laughs> uh, Would you all mind if we if I brought up my boards that I brought as backup? No. Sure. No. Okay. You guys have an issue with that? No. Nope. Sorry about that. I have an easel. Let me officially actually open the hearing and then there you go, the board back. Um so I'd like to open the hearing still at seven thirty PM. Continuation of Ford Crossing with request by the applicant that the board continue. Oh, this is start reading this. Continuation of a hearing on definitive subdivision for Ford Crossing off Village Hill Road as advertised February 9th and February 16th, 2012. Um, 
so while I'm not sure, at the last meeting, you guys just opened this and we really continued it. So no discussion. Uh, so all of us were present at the last discussion, the one that was up in Wayne's office. Was everybody here for this one, for that one? <coughs> so we're all eligible to vote. Um, and then I think Carolyn handed out uh, at the beginning of the meeting, these are the DPW, there's 37. No, th that's, those are proposed conditions. I also sent to you the DPW comments, so that was just which have been, right, right. Right. Which right. have been incorporated, um, their comments have been incorporated as yeah, proposed conditions right. into that, plus standard planning board conditions. Okay, has the applicant seen these? Yes. If they were sent out a month ago, they would have it. Fairly similar to what we have. Right. With some deletions uh, and then one modification. Okay. Right, because 22 is blank. Oh. Yeah. So. But it goes to 23. Okay. If I may, we, we have a uh, draft okay. for 22. Oh, you have? Okay. My name's uh, Mike Schneider, I represent the applicant. May I send sure. these out? Mm -hmm. City solicitor has seen these as well as uh, planning department. We have an awful long paragraph. Let me try to say it. <laughs> try to say it once to finish. You can see that from across the room. Yeah, I'll die here too. So. Yep. These are the most recent plans. Okay. So we should throw out what we have? No. No, it's probably the same next year. Oh, these plans? The plans. Okay. Yeah. It may be the same. There. No, they're not. You're up, you're up. We made some revisions so our discussion in the DPW in their last uh, memo. Okay. The set, the set we have is dated 125. These are dated 28, so we should toss. Yeah, there were a few oh, comments. Hey, so DPW. There were a few comments from the DPW memo. They issued one on. The ninth. If we can introduce ourselves, my name's Alan Delaney. I'm the Director of Engineering. I was here on January 9th along with uh, John Perry from Gale Associates and Beth Murphy is the Project Manager for Mass Development, who most of you know from past sessions. Yep. And Michael Schneider is our attorney that's representing us. <coughs> Thank you. We met on January 9th, and as a result of January 9th, uh, Mr. Gilson, you had suggested that we make some changes relative to uh, how our notes and, uh, their, and how the paths were designated and the plans. Those have been made. Uh, John Perry from Gale Associates and myself have been in conversation with DPW on numerous occasions since January 9th for, for their comments and how they should be resolved. We've made changes on these plans. Uh, we believe that uh, almost all of the DPW comments are made, other than I have two comments I'll make later. Um, but all of the specific uh, labeling, uh, notation uh, issues have been addressed and are on the set of plans that you should be reviewing right now. The main, for the main uh, concern that you guys had last time, and probably the thing you care most about, is that we labeled the uh, proposed future trail network in the vicinity of the uh, development, as well as the uh, Beach Street Park, the protected open space, uh, showing that approximate lot location as well. So those are those have been addressed. Which, which page are you looking at? That's on C6. Yep. There's a, few, there's a handful of uh, notes, and, and it's a heavy dashed line showing yeah. the approximate trail location that will be built in the future. What's um? Do you have? Do you want to just go through it, and then we'll, we'll have questions. Definitely. Sure. I mean, it's it's uh it's very much the same that we showed you last time. Yep. Um, I think. Refresh my memory. I'll yeah. refresh my memory. So let me just start from the beginning, give everyone a brief overview for all on the same page here. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware of the Village Hill project that's working off of Prince Street. It's uh, the old state hospital. It's been being developed for the last ten years or so. Uh, multiple roadways are already in existence, as shown on our existing conditions photographic photo. The area that we plan to develop is an extension of Ford Crossing uh, north of the existing coach house. As you shown in the aerial photo, it's essentially already, um, you see this dirt uh, roadway going through there, it's, it's almost following that uh, footprint. 
So it's it's uh, it's open space. It's gravel right now, and it's uh, not vegetated whatsoever. Um, we're not within 100 feet of any uh, environmental features, wetlands or otherwise. The proposed development is intended to facilitate the build out of um, residential houses and possibly townhouses in the North Campus, as uh, roughly shown in the approved master plan. Mm -hmm. Who that picture in that? Master plan. Yeah, the current master plan is that in here? In what you just in what no, you, what you just handed us? No, it's not part of the subdivision plans. Right. Um, yeah, it's a bit of rocks. I think what I'm curious about is always the current master plan never quite matches up to what is on here. So I'm not sure. Are you guys planning to go to the CAC? We've already been to the CAC, and in fact, um, I'd be happy to come back and update you um, at the next meeting on the master plan. Well, who, and who's who's lead? Are are we in front of the CAC? Do they, you know? Is this is the master plan that the last CAC is most recently approved the one that you're showing us, or are we seeing something that's different from what? When we submitted this plan, we had not done the uh, presented the updates to the master plan to the CAC. So on uh, February 8th, we went and did that presentation. And so now this the updated master plan is on the website. So, um, you have a copy? Yes. So I'll just hand that out. There are separate jurisdictions. CEC just sort of generally says, okay, here are the number of units we're going to approve, and here's generally the layout. They don't look at the details. They don't permit anything. They don't have any evaluation of whether the project meets special permit, site plan, or subdivision criteria. So well, even if the CAC says, okay, we grant 350 units, that doesn't mean they're permitted. It doesn't mean they're permitted in any particular location or format, you know, townhouse versus single family. You all have jurisdiction to determine whether or not the plan village build out meets the zoning criteria, meets you know the, the original special permit, and meets subdivision rules. So CAC hasn't really hasn't voted yet on this master plan, but that's immaterial as it relates to whether or not the master plan is meeting any special permit or subdivision rules. It's really more, particularly for them, it's more conceptual. Oh, here's a general layout, and we know it's going to change because it has to meet the standards in the zoning. Oh, it's, it's definitely conceptual. I mean, they, they choose to put in houses up here. They could have just said, we're going to put a whole bunch of houses up here. You know, not going to, this is not something we're going to hold them to necessarily. So when, the C, when you guys at the CSC are voting on this, you're not expecting this is what you're going to see up there in five years. I'm not. No. You're, I mean, it all depends on whether they can sell it or not, what they can sell. Right, but that's an understanding that the, what yeah. you guys aren't voting on is what you want to see up there, but you're, it's a right. conceptual density, number of units, basic overall. Confidence. I think that maps the plan is, like you said, to show you know, that they intend to build residential units and an approximate density, and this subdivision application before you is. Uh, to build the roadways that will facilitate right. some build out uh, in accordance with that conceptual uh, master plan. Right, and I think one of the things that for us to discuss tonight as well is you know, sort of, uh, a subdivision is a road, but we're, we always look at the park, the, the trail, mm -hmm. the monument. You know, yeah, that's we, on there. No. Right, it's on, uh, yeah, it's, it's on the plan, yeah, but okay. there's a difference. There's a site plan. And then there's the subdivision plan. The subdivision plan is really the road. So does that make sense? Right. Well, you're, you're both essentially. Right. In the, in the packet. All right. So on you go. <clears throat> uh, just give you a, a little rough idea for what the existing um, where we're tying in. We're gonna uh, extend Village Hill Road, which is the Hammerhead portion of the site now, just in front of the coach house. We're gonna extend the roadway at the corner of Ford Crossing and Musanti, and we're going to extend Olander Drive, all of which are existing roadways uh, shown in the pictures here, which might be a little hard for you to see, but they're all um, bituminous uh, concrete that we're tying into. We're going to extend the sidewalks and uh, provide sidewalks for regulation. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you sent the is here. Oh, there. Okay, that's and what then, I moved after. Yeah, exactly. For the existing four crossing is where that corner meets there. Olander is way to the uh, east. So essentially, those roadways are being extended. Four crossings coming over to Pine. Uh, we're providing sidewalks on both sides of the road. Uh, we had a discussion last time as to where that sidewalk wants to be within the right of way, and we argued that we wanted it uh, up against the curb and in the parking area. DPW actually wants it at the back of the right of way. Uh, we've actually conceded to the DPW's wishes to put it at the back of the right of way. So we want it. <laughs> Except uh, we're going to keep it one foot off of the right of way to uh, have a construction tolerance because in the past there have been some issues with putting it right on the right of way, going on the curb, you can't build it exactly. You're over by an inch and now you need an easement. So Well I'll tell you I was up there driving there. around today and every sidewalk up there is at the back of the right of way. There's a tree belt. You know, I know we talked about this a lot at the last meeting where you know you guys in particular were talking about putting the, the sidewalk on the curb. I don't remember this conversation. Right. There's parking. There's parking that do I step out on the grass yeah. when I get out of my car yeah, yeah. or do I step on the sidewalk? Every sidewalk up there is on the other side is on the far side of the tree belt. So the only that, one that isn't is on Village Hill Road itself. Uh, no, that's not true. I drove down Village Hill Road today. Just Village Hill Road is right up against the um, the park the on street parking. Where yeah, where because um, there's actually about only for the cutouts. Only at the cutouts. There's about six or seven the, feet of right of way behind the sidewalk. Just yes, because it's been done wrong before doesn't mean you have to. Well, no, I, I think what we have here is what I wanted. This is exactly yes, yeah, so the only place you, it was up on the curb was where there's those cut up. Yeah, right. exactly. We, we don't have parking, it's you have the tree belt and then the parking kind of encroaches on that. But we're, we're doing it the way the rake say, the way DPW wants it, and so perfectly everyone's happy now. We're providing adequate street trees, uh, street lighting. Um, Tangents, radiuses. There's a few uh, waivers that we've been over before, and I think there's been a memo approving most of those waivers. Um, all having to do with uh, slight variations in geometry. Um, uh, all of the roadways are fairly gently graded. There haven't been very many comments or discussions regarding the grading or site drainage. It's uh, pretty straightforward. The only portion that's over a 2% slope is where we're tying in from um, the intersection now with Village Hill and Ford Crossing with New uh, South and Ford Crossing, and that's, I think, 6%, uh, which is uh, still below the maximum that is allowed. Sorry, uh, just to interrupt. Annette, are you building the driveway in the upper right corner, or is the, the, the potential developer for that corner building that driveway? Uh, which one are you talking about? In here? Uh, no, down. Yeah. Oh, no, no, the Share driveway, the shared oh, driveway. Are you guys no. building that? Uh, yes, we're going to build it to uh, binary grade. Okay, so you are building that. The yeah. common driveway. Yeah. Common driveway. Yeah. Common driveway. Yeah. yeah. That would be that's part that's of this. There's going to be a hammerhead at the end of it. Uh, no, just down. And there's going to be um, driveways off of that into uh, garages. Right. Oh, I just so thought, thought in the last clip was a hammerhead so you could turn around. No, there wasn't. Yeah. Oh, no. No. Essentially, you can discuss the fire truck can back out. Oh, is that what it was? Okay, we had the discussion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then cars can essentially turn into the, the driveway or they'd be backing out of their garages and there's going to be a, a small portion at the end of that we can use to make that maneuver. Good. <coughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. I have a, actually a quick question about that. Just looking at the conceptual plan on each tree Park and the memorial park is somewhat divorced. Is there any way that you've thought of of actually uh, getting them so that they're just literally across the road? It would be nice to have a continuation. Well, there's already, uh, there's already houses built. These the, are already. Yeah, up to that, up to that oh, yeah, point. Lose so. that one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's on my call. Jonathan, you want to move your house? Yeah. Just let, let, let us talk about it. Sure <laughs> yeah, um, this memorial park idea has just been presented to the CAC February uh, 8th, and um, formerly in the former master plan, memorial park had been voted up here, and the memorial committee of the CAC subcommittee is the one who 
is really uh, taking the lead on where that park goes. Um, we think this new location is a much better location. It's actually where the uh, fountain that was in front of Old Main, that's its original location. Um, plus, it's right in the center of the development, um, and it's got addresses the street straight on. We think that the kind of park that they're looking for, which is kind of contemplative uh, park that uh, brings you back to the original purpose of, of the state hospital, um, is really well served by this. And then we will work with them to actually design it, work with the CAC. Um, one other thing you should know about that is that the city intends that this should be a public park. Um, and so this park will uh, come back to you for review. Um, I don't know if you guys care too much about the uh, utilities, but we've worked with DPW over the last uh, many months, and we've all the uh, issues that they had with any of our utilities resolved uh, to date now. Just, yeah, uh, yeah so you guys care about it since the, you have different facilities. Well, the, well um, the only thing I would say is, so you forwarded this, and I didn't have time to read, I think it was 10 pages long, the, the, the PDF from the DPW today. Uh, not admitting that I did not read it. Um, have they signed off on Yeah, that? a lot of their comments were, so it was sort of a stream of comments from the original um, review and then how it had been addressed or not addressed and then how it had been subsequently addressed or not addressed and then final proposed condition. So what, um, so the DPW signed off on it was really just sort of the trail of thought for um, all those initial comments. So I have taken the ones that where they requested conditions and plunked them into that draft set of conditions that would address their final you know, comments, essentially. So we're going to have to go through. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I want to point out, too, uh, in regards to DPW comments is that we do have a stormwater permit. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. <laughs> um, this slide shows uh, profiles, and again, it really just shows the grading that I talked about before. Everything's fairly gently graded and meets all of the subdivision requirements. Um, and then this is our watershed plan showing that we're maintaining all the watersheds that were permitted in 2003 and then again in 2007 and now it's been updated. Um, a couple of these areas shifted with you know, the actual location of where four crossing ended up and actual impervious and impervious areas. So everything jives with these plans now, and that's what our stormwater permit has been based off of. So everything's up to date. Um, I guess I have some design questions before I think um, Alan and Beth maybe have a few other things to address. Anybody have any questions over so far? Great, thank you. Uh, I don't know if your intent, uh, Mr. Gilson, was to go through each, co each, each of the 36 comments, but I just had a couple of comments on a couple of them. Yeah, I think we're probably going to have to go through. Okay, then I'll wait for you to get to the points then. Yeah. Does anybody have any other, another part of the presentation? Uh, I want to ask the, what's the exact scope of what we are approving today. So what we're approving today, and this is where it's, uh, I think there's, we'll probably have a little discussion, but what we're approving today is the road. Okay, it has nothing to do with Memorial Park or Beach Park directly. Um, because no. under subdivision, um, under subdivision rules, you need to know what the uses are, proposed uses, um, abutting the streets. You have a vague idea um, of what the uses are, except for, I mean, there's one block that seems to be pretty firm because there's an application that's going to come before you in a couple of weeks on that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, they're going to have to come back for site plan approval for any use that hasn't been previously so any um, the parks that are showing there, the Memorial Park will have to come through the site plan approval. Um, so what you're, um, what's before you now are street are the streets, so the extension of Ford Village Hill and Olander, and the infrastructure that goes along with it. Um, there are, which we'll get into as we go through this. There are is still the outstanding issue of how. 
the linkages of the trails cross the streets that they're constructing. So I think it's valid for there to be at least one condition that will go through um, related to that because since they haven't fully designed the path, it, it is likely they'll have to come back and reconfigure um, some of the streets that they may build if they go ahead and build without fully designing. So that's where there's some issue of uh, potential conflict between what you approve and things that they haven't quite figured out what to do. Yeah. Um, sorry, did you have Oh, no, that, I, I think that's an accurate uh, description. And, and our draft comment 22 is meant to address uh, some, of, some of our concerns okay. about the pathway. Thank you. Um, is there anything else formally you guys want to talk about before we have questions and start going through the conditions? Um, there were. Do you think it makes sense for me to put this up on the screen so as we go through it, if there are any. I, is there can you put it, can you? Yeah, it? I have the cable. I just need to run it over to that sure. side. Um, and we can talk for a second because I think uh, Carolyn and, well, at the last meeting we talked a bit about um, how to definitively define the Peach Tree Park as being a park. Right. That it was going to be somehow delineated on the plan as it was never going to be built on. And I think the other part that Carolyn started talking about was we, we spent a lot of time talking about the paths. We wanted to see the paths on the plan. Uh, I think what we're going to be discussing in a minute is to whether or not we can, as we define the subdivision, we can actually say that each have to show us where the part, where the, where the uh, path is going to be. So, um, Carolyn, do you want me to just go through the, the 30, start going through yeah. the 36? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Um, number one, prior to endorsements of the definitive plan, Performance guarantee that conforms to the Northampton subdivision. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Yep. Final construction quantities and budgets to be submitted for review and approved by the DBW. Um, again, pretty straightforward. Um, the owners' association shall be expanded if necessary to incorporate references to lots created in the subdivision prior to the first lot sale as an assurance that the owners' association will perform required capital improvements and their maintenance. Now, will these six lots, I think, what we're talking about, will they be part of the owners' association? Yes. This is the North Land Owners Association. And so is every house, is every unit in the North? And the North Campus is in the North They're all in the association. I just have a quick question. I couldn't actually pass that one because the, the bracket doesn't close. Uh, where's the, where's the sub close? Oh, at the end of three? At the end, it uh, goes all the way? Okay. Right, number four, prior to the construction of the road, the applicant must report all covenants. The covenant shall not require financial, shall not require financial payment from the owner of the open space area. Again, very straightforward. All maintenance of the roadway infrastructure and sidewalk shall be, shall be responsible to the owner's association until such time as the city accepts the street. Snow removal on the sidewalks is the responsibility of the owner or owner's association and shall not be part of the covenants. This includes the paved walkways bordering and within the open space. Um, so question, I mean, point number five, Carolyn has the line, this includes the paved walkways bordering and within the open space. We're going to have this issue where we haven't defined the paved walkways in the open space yet. Is that a problem? Sorry, you were typing. Um, what, what's the right sentence? So number five, the last sentence of number five. So we're saying, you know, snow removal on sidewalks is the responsibility of the owner or owner's association. This includes paved walkways bordering within the open space. But we haven't, the plans, <laughs> we're going to get to in a second, don't show where those paved paths through the open space are. So Just to say when constructed. Is that, yeah, I'm not sure if that's going to be. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it may not, it, it's, it certainly was applicable and um, for, um, I mean, there there are segments of sidewalk that go along this Beach Tree Park, mm -hmm. um, so you know they're going to have to be responsible for that too. So, that's so the owners' right. association is going to be responsible for plowing and maintaining those walkways within the park within that block. Yeah. yeah. Seems to me it's pretty comprehensive what it says. Yeah. Yep. Right. We're, we're fine. Okay. Great. 
present or future? Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's just that we're saying they're there. Uh, the organization, uh, the owners association shall be responsible for all snow removal on the sidewalks that are 10 foot wide and that those that barter open space regardless of ownership of the area. Has the city taken any of the streets up there or is the city planning? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, Village Hill, yeah. um, the portion of Olander and Mosier and Usanti were just taken like oh, a month okay. ago. D January. Yep. So. Okay. so the city is already up there plowing. Yeah. Well, no. We haven't had any snow yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ski in this week. They're ready. <laughs> Prior to endorsement, the proposed future use lot, future house lot label on the east side of Old Lander at the intersection of Ford Crossing shall be removed from all planned sheets. It has. So that, that note could go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, break, no curb cut is allowed for the parcel on the east side of Old Lander at the intersection of Ford and Old Lander unless through other planes where approval compliance with the special permit can be made. That, that's not where Excuse me, that's a, that's a different uh, draft comment than we received. Okay, I got, this is the one I got today. Number eight. Number eight? Are talking about number eight? No, seven. Nice no, number eight. No, that, that was um, actually in response to Craig's um, comment, because it first said no curb cut is allowed on the parcel on the east side of Olander, the intersection of Ford, and um, Craig and Beth shot back that no they want to say unless there's some approval from the planning board so yeah and that's, that's, that's but that's different than what was just read yeah. what? oh your number seven is my number eight you took one out because so i just deleted it. the one that they said was not necessary anymore but it renumbered everything else. oh so it renumbered everything should i not have deleted it i'll undo okay. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how's that <laughs> Um, number nine, I have an issue with because we're tr still trying to address with city solicitor what the timing on this is. We can't uh, hope that you wouldn't um, hold up the project for a, a governmental action to occur. Uh, when Village Hill Road was accepted, the ears of the hammerhead were included because at the time we had not uh, had plans and knew our schedule of how we were going to extend, when we were going to extend Village Hill. So that hammer had actually provided the turnaround for emergency vehicles and DPW vehicles. But now we're extending Village Hill Road so that those ears of the hammerhead want to get turned back from the city to us so that we can continue to develop. What DPW says in their comment is that it has to happen prior to construction. And we're certainly going to do it, but unfortunately city solicitor was came on new last Friday and we haven't had the opportunity to discuss this with the new city solicitor and the old city solicitor said wait for the new city solicitor to us a couple of weeks ago. So we intend to bring this. We don't know if it is going to require a city council vote or if there's some other administrative way that this could happen. But we're, we're actively pursuing this. So when we say uh, or unless otherwise arranged by the agreement between the city and mass development? Um, yeah, I mean, we could, the, the city could also grant an easement until the transfer can happen, you know, construction easement or something, which might be faster, yeah. I don't know. But that, You might run into the same concerns if the city is conveying property interests on the timing through an easement. It should be fairly routine. What I'm just saying, I mean, because we want to word it such that uh, unless some other arrangement can be worked out yeah. between the city and mass development, and if the lawyers... City solicitor and you guys work on the agreement. Right. I think it's going to be fine with us. Whether or not it's fine with city council, I can't speak to. Yeah, maybe a side letter or something that city solicitor and our council agrees right. upon. I'm happy with putting the language in so you guys can work it out. <coughs> Thank you. Um, let me know when you're ready, Carol. Yeah. All right, handicap ramps are required at all sidewalk corners. John, is that settled? Is that done? Yes. Yes. That's uh, that's that's all done. Um, Eleven. Don't worry, I learned my lesson. <laughs> Eleven. A warrant analysis is required to determine if there is a need for the proposed stop signs in Village Hill Road at Fort Crossing and on Fort Crossing at Olander. 
drive. If the warrants are met, the installation of stop signs must be approved by city council. Well, my guess is that that's got to be for the like this is city yeah. council. I didn't think I'd do stop signs, but the DPW could do it. We had looked into this and discussed it with DPW, and it doesn't it does not trigger a warrant for stop signs. And they had some specific signage that they wanted us to put in instead of stop signs, and that's now in the plans, and uh, it's, it's all been addressed with uh, DPW. So the stop signs are out? Correct. So what can you put instead of stop sign? Uh, they wanted um, pedestrian crossing signs at, at all of the crosswalks and a few other warning signs that are kind of traffic calming. We're still incl including all the handicap ramps in the corners so that the pedestrian signs act kind of as a indication that there's a, there's an intersection there. So number twelve can be deleted too. You know, possibly I could I could envision that uh, if we went into the next phase and extended Orlando further, maybe at that time then there may be a stop sign added. But for the time being, it's a dead end. I mean, you can't go any farther. If that becomes a stop sign, why city council? I mean, there, I know it's a far more difficult process than you would think, but doesn't the city council have to wait on stop sign? I got this language from DTPW, and they're my engineer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so, so can 12, 13, and 14 be deleted too? Did you already take care of all those? This the in your revised plan? Um, yeah. No, I can see that. Okay. I think that the double-sided pedestrian crossings, uh, that's what they wanted instead of the stop signs. Right, so you put that on the revised that's plan? That's in the plan, yeah. Okay. And then what about pedestrian crossings are fluorescent yellow green? That's in the plan as well. Okay, see, we're not having 36 conditions. Yeah, 15 is done too. Why, um, uh, Carol, Carol, I thought we standardized on um, a certain color. I mean, is this going to be a different color than everything? No, this is, that's the standard that color. That is the standard color. It just wasn't shown in the detail. Number 15, the white slope bar stripe shall be one foot wide, not two feet wide. That's been addressed. Because I'm not sure what two feel, as indicated, would mean. Anyway. <laughs> 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 it doesn't feel yeah, too yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's being deleted, that's how it they, feels. Yeah. <laughs> Old number 16, the detailed call out for signage is 7 7B slash C15, not C17. That's been addressed as well. That's okay. Carol, let me know if I'm getting ahead of you. Wheelchair yeah. ramp type 3 is called out at the road A crossing, but the detail referred to is incorrect and no type 3 detail is provided. That's been addressed as well. Uh, cool, we're halfway. Street signs in accordance with city standards shall be placed at intersections prior to the issuance of the first building permit. It's a standard condition. Number 19, sidewalk shall be continuous with no brakes or curb cuts. Again, standard condition. Uh, let's see. Number 20, sidewalk shall be one foot from the edge of the property line as indicated. That was a concession from DPW that we've met. Okay, you met that one. 21, the cement concrete walk detail shall indicate 8 inch of processed gravel, not 6 inches. Done. Done. Okay. We'll skip 22 for right now. 23, um, there's a long one. Um, this is, I think, about, oh no, hold it. That looks like our 22. Right, 20, yeah, so let's go to the 24. Um, path should be on the outside edge of the drip lines of the beech trees. That must be referring to the path through the, what's labeled beech tree part of the park. Yeah, it's the yeah. east-west path, but if... Uh, I guess this is a this is a little bit um, difficult because we are addressing a path network through Beach Tree Park, mm -hmm. and there's no way to stay outside of the drip line for the whole path network. So we understand the issues, and we have a landscape architect with Beals and Thomas working on that design, and are close to bringing that forth to, for planning staff to see. But it's kind of it's not within the subdivision road that we're proposing, so I think it may be inappropriate to put this in the conditions. They have to come back for site plan approval for that park and the layout. So yeah. 
Well, so let's let, let's do the Beach Tree Park because that's probably the easier without getting into the paths right now. So at the last meeting, we said we want to see a delineation that the Beach Tree Park is a park. Yeah, and on on that lot sheet that John pointed out, uh, where we showed the do, the dark dotted lines, right. we've added added the note. And you can see the dark, dark dotted lines actually create what we are initially envisioning as that path network through Beach Tree Park. Which plan? Which C6. 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 So what it says on the plan is approximate location of Beach Tree Park, future protected open space, not a residential lot. So yeah. I guess the question for me I'm not sure if everybody else, for everybody else, does that is that a guarantee that that's a park, or is that uh, a statement of intent that it might someday be a park, but we're not telling you it's well, a park it's, right now? What we can say, give you is as much comfort in us telling you it's going to be a park. The one thing, the one thing we don't know is the western property line. Yeah. With the other three are pretty much set. So when does it become a park? As soon as I can determine that fourth line. I know. Well, so you're going to come back with a site plan for the upper right corner, or I think Jonathan, I guess you're coming back with a site plan on mass development sometime in the next few months. That's going to pretty much put the southern or the northern border of the park. Yes. The road has the east and the south. Yes. And the western border, when do we get that? We have an RFI out on the street of Bethesda's for a developer, um, and I think it's what, next week? Or at the end of this uh, week is the tomorrow, response. Tomorrow, tomorrow. The responses are due, and so our hope is to in that area to the west where they show the townhomes uh, that we'll get a proposal, be able to negotiate with a developer to develop that area, and then that western boundary will be set. Um, but we will be able to show you uh, the pathways more specifically in Beach Tree Park uh, when uh, right builders come to that end. Well, I guess the, there's so the, the two parts are. I, the paths are one issue, and the park itself, to, or, to me, they're two different issues. One is designating that area as a park. And it is the, it will be designated in the covenants and declarations of the Landowners Association. I mean, I think you can find some level of comfort. They really can't put any use to any parcel of land up here until they get site plan approval. So right. they couldn't put a house there until they get site plan approval. They can't put a park there until they get site plan approval. So essentially, it's blank now. So well, you would have to approve, you would have to make a determination whether whatever use, if they come in for 10 units there, you'd have to make the determination if that's consistent with a special permit approved. Well, I guess the reason I struggle with it is because I know when Jonathan Wright comes in in a few months, whenever he comes in, part of his plan is based on the fact that those houses are but a park. And so if he comes in with a site plan that says, I'm going to build these houses, hey, and there's going to be a park here, but somebody else comes in six months from now and says, hey, I don't want the park. I want to put a couple houses there. Well, that's, you know, what <laughs> well, guarantee you, you that the people who buy those houses have that that's a park? Well, that's not your problem, though. Your problem is making sure that it complies with the um, special permit criteria for Plan Village and, the, and site plan approval. So, you know, originally there wasn't a park proposed here, and, and but there was, you know, different mechanisms were um, identified to protect the signature trees that were on site, and this happens to be one of those mechanisms to do that. But so I don't think, I mean, and because of the piecemeal nature of this, I would, I would say try to look at it as the, you know, the single family, the bungalow lots out on the western portion of the um, project you were told they're going to be bungalow lots. You saw the lots delineated actually in the subdivision, but you don't know what's going to happen north of that. And that's sort of a changing, you know, landscape in terms of what can be marketed and, and that kind of thing. So if someone buys a house on that um, bungalow lot section of the project, they don't know what's going to happen north of them at this point. It's a similar, I would say it's a similar situation, whether it's a park or a, you know, another house lot that comes behind those houses. Yeah. And either way, it needs approval from you guys to ensure that it meets the criteria that you already approved in special permit. Well, but there's a difference between, you know, delineating something as either conservation land or protected or that's permanent versus just nobody having a plan to put anything on it right now. 
and one's permanent, and one's just like, well, you know, we might get one someday. Yeah. So. And just, just to address that, in the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions for the North Landowners Association, this is going to be shown as part. Is going to be shown, but yes. when, it, when, it, when will that, is that happen? That will be recorded. We're, we're happy to, we have to update the recording um, every time we add more lots to this, to the association, and so that will be part of that recording of that lot. Uh, I think I'm still not sure. When does that happen? That, that will happen um, after the, the, as it says in here, after the, the right builder's lots are coming on. We can't sell those lots until we update the recording of the landowner's covenants and restrictions, and it will be in that updated recording. As soon as we generate the westernmost boundary. Right. And so... Yeah, uh, excuse me, uh, Jonathan, right, right, builders. Um, Maybe it's anecdotal, but the discussion of this path and the park has been going on for some some time. And um, our contract with Mass Development, our land disposition agreement, requires them to design, permit, and build that park by September 2012. Now that's not your action, but it is a contractual obligation that they've entered into. Right, and that's and, that's and I want just so that you knew that it's it's not the same as your authority but it has uh, some standing. Right, I guess for me it's just I want to make sure it stays a park forever. Yes. You know, for as long or long as ever can be. And a contract between you and Mass Development doesn't give me as much reassurance as... Totally understand. I think it's very important that that recording happen at the time that uh, we begin to acquire these lots, not relevant to the future lot line on the west, uh, should that be further delayed some months or years. because. Right. Um, our buyers are going to require that that uh, be permanent. Right. I think, I so think we have to work out the timing of that. Right. I'm sorry, Mark. Thank you. Okay. We just say for the development of those six lots, the covenant will be recorded, or make it a covenant that it will be recorded in the owners' association and that that part before that. construction of the right. or before final acceptance or before yeah. just just to lock it in so that right. with the development comes the declaration right. I don't understand why the west border is sort of fluid. It, it, it's shown on the plan as coming straight down and being collinear with the line at the west. Of the, the Which is where we would hope it would be. But we want to leave the flexibility of moving at five or ten feet this way or that way to the developer who actually puts the proposal together to fill in that Lot. That's the first I've heard of the five feet or ten feet. What if it's twenty feet? Right? I, I, I think we, we need, as, as the owner of the property, to negotiate with a prospective developer to develop the lot and not shoehorn them and 10 or 15 feet would kill their proposal. Yeah, I actually think that the, the relevant focus here is that we're going to design and build this park by September of 2012. And therefore, we'll know the western boundary at that time. So you got to, before you can build it, you got to come to us with a site plan for that park. We're close. But when you come to us with a site plan for that park, you're going to have a boundary on it, and we're going to say that's the boundary. And right. We want that's right, the park. Right. And the reason we haven't uh, come to you is we got our five proposals due tomorrow, so we're close. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to move ahead on this. Then you know, I, get, I mean, we can say today. Before, you know, you have one applicant who's going to be coming in in probably a month or two with his plan. You have another possible park being built maybe by September of 2012. You're saying you're contractually obligated to build this park, but you guys can't even define the boundaries of the park. No, we can define the boundaries of the park. And I also, it's important for you to understand that it's, it, it, the Landowners Association is responsible for the maintenance of this park. And we're having in their covenants the restriction that this will always be a park. So that's the mechanism that tells you this is a park. That's but it sounds like you guys can change the boundaries of that park anytime you want. But I think the issue is Once it's, it's not recorded, we can't in the covenants. We can't. I think the issue is um, what the the permit in front of you is for the creation of a street, mm -hmm. and not necessarily the creation 
and not the creation of these six single family house lots and not the creation of the park and not creation of townhouse structures. So if you sort of take that and focus on what's in front of you, then the park boundary really sort of falls away from that um, because it's not part of this permit application and permit request. It would be, when they come in for a permit for site plan, you couldn't approve a site plan without a hard and fast boundary and without a condition about when it's recorded, how it's recorded, whether it's in perpetuity or not. Right. Okay, well, hypothetically, if, if they came in with the, with the western border being 20 feet east of where it's shown now, could we vote it down? Or is this just no, a because this is not your, the, they're not asking for approval of a park. No, I mean when the, when the park approval comes in. Or whenever, in when the, the, when the, yeah, when the site only comes in. only to the extent that you feel like it's not consistent with a special permit for villa, for the village hill. So I'm just worried we're going to back ourselves into a corner that everybody's saying yes, there's going to be a park there, but I can't tell but you what it's going to look like. But, but you have to make the determination at the time it comes to you what the purpose of the park is. Is it fulfilling that pur purpose? And I mean, you also have to remember that the original. I, I mean, there are a lot of little parks within the village and there's also a ton of open space outside and so I, I wouldn't argue from an urban development perspective that you need all those parks and so you would have to decide at that time whether a smaller park is not meeting the principles of Village Hill versus a larger park and make that determination um, but I don't think that's part of the subdivision approval now that would be part of your site plan to make a determination whether it's consistent with the original special permit. I was actually just trying to say what, what Carolyn was saying, that um, I don't think that's really what's in front of us right now, and I'm quite happy to move on and deal with this when we come to a site plan. Well, 24, we already talked about the leaving. Yeah, let's just go well, ahead with our conditions here. Because this isn't really, No, the light, 25 is about the light yeah. on the street. Yeah, so why are we hung up here? Because the 24, one of the ones, whatever the one we were just on. It was about the path. Right, we can't yeah. find the path. The park. I mean, we can't, if we can't find the park, yeah, we can find the path. You might say they're being a little evasive about it. Well, I guess to me, I mean, my the concern is... 24 is marked as deleted. Oh, right, but... Uh, However we got here, this was a, an issue from the last meeting was we wanted a delineation that this is a park. And the other thing we talked about at the last meeting was we wanted to see some kind of design or idea of where these paths are going to go through this park. And I think what they're saying is they can't tell us, they can't guarantee or give us a guarantee really that it's going to be a park. They can say in the future we can probably guarantee that it's going to be a park. We can't do it now. And that I think what we're going to hear next is that they can't tell us where the paths are going to go. But what, what's going to happen is when those paths go in, they may have to rip up part of the roads. And we're going to say, well, that's your nickel. You've got to rip up a road to put in the park or to put in the paths. Then you're going to have to do that. So does that, I know you're standing, you probably want to weigh in on this. So go ahead. I, I, I think Carolyn's, or been, her description of, of uh, what's before you tonight is, is pretty apt. Um, when it comes to open space and the pathways that we'll, we'll get to, that aren't part of this subdivision approval. The ultimate, uh, your ultimate remedy is the 2002 special permit, which was uh, uh, from the from the get go has been a conceptual idea of where these parks and paths would be. But I, it's not appropriate uh, on the approval of this street to, to condition that other property but here. But we're going to have a social a site plan in front of us in a month or two. And Jonathan Wright just said he has a contractual agreement with mass development that that is going to be a park. So when you guys come to us for a site plan that says you two have an agreement that that's a park, I would be very strongly <coughs> in favor of seeing it somewhere recorded that that's a park. And that's what I yeah. keep referring to in the Declaration and Covenants of Restriction of the North Owners Association is going to recognize this as a park and that declaration gets recorded and it is intended to be a in park perpetuity? in perpetuity. Is perpetuity. So what you're saying, it could never not be a park? Uh, it could never not be a park unless, I, I suppose, in, uh, I think... Well, yeah, unless some, somebody else changed it. No, no. Can, can we, we make, I don't, uh, can we make another condition, not now, because I don't think it's relevant now. 
but in the month, whatever, when those six lots yeah. come, yeah. that that's okay. So when I it's guess, recorded. All right, so we can move on. Just so you guys have heard us, or you've heard me. I guess it's really I really no, care I'm, about. I'm with you. And Franny, okay, good. Franny's with you. Dead. <laughs> we this you might be saying that this is not apropos to the subdivision, and I could probably agree with that. But when we come into a site plan for this parcel, it's going to be very apropos to that discussion. Yes, I, but there's a legal nuance here that's important to make, which is the planning uh, board cannot designate park area uh, in its plans without it being considered a taking and then just compensation being paid. But you've that. already made an agreement with the builder that it is going to be a park. Yeah, but that, exactly. That's a so I'm talking a about the legal mechanisms right. here. And so that's why this is being done through the declarations and covenants. That's the legal mechanism uh, that's appropriate to uh, having this be a park in perpetuity. The planning board cannot just say, yeah. we want a park here in perpetuity. That's not allowed it's under your regulation. It's, it, and it's not allowed on the, on the face of the statute. Yeah, you guys have never done that. When they've shown the park, like the open space along the Olander, said, this is going to be our open space. So the condition is, as the applicant offered, this open space has to be permanently restricted as open space because you guys said it was going to be open space. So we're going to take you at face value. Show us that you're... I mean, you, yeah, actually. usually we get people to put that in, you know, with a cluster. Oh, they have to. You know, yeah. yeah. It's not that you're taking the land. It's they're offering it. Right. This is how they're going to meet the special permit criteria. They're offering the open space. Okay, you're offering it. Offer it all the way to the bank. Basically. Yeah, that's I guess what I'm asking. Right. Offer yeah. it all the way to the bank. And, and again, I want to point out that the, what governs clusters is different than what governs planned village. So in the cluster, you specifically say you want to put it in a certain kind of conservation restriction, and that's appropriate to the cluster. Here, it's appropriate to put that restriction in the in the covenants and restrictions. And, and we can show you, you know, we can give you the form of that at the next uh, site plan. Well, I guess that it's, so we're all know we're going to have this conversation again in a few months. And, and uh, yeah. so, okay, I'll let it go for now. Um, so are we done with the paths and we can't talk about the paths? No, we're going to talk about the paths. All right, let's talk about the paths. Um, so as long as we're doing this, let's talk about the paths. Is that number 22 that, yeah. that we have here? So what we talked about last time was we wanted to see paths. So I just want to, sh the thing that was handed out tonight is a modification of what um, was discussed. So and let me give you some background information. Um, the, um, there were a bunch of conditions, draft conditions that were sent out for in, ahead of the last hearing that related to, you know, making sure that this, wherever the bike path was connected to the sidewalks, it was 10 feet wide. There were four or five conditions that were um, objectionable to the applicant because of the claim that it was outside the purview of subdivision approval. So um, I drafted some language and had the city solicitor look at it for an alternative to essentially put the applicant on notice that, um, you know, there are, in order to meet the special permit criteria that was approved for creating a network of linked paths, east, west, and north, south, throughout the campus. Um, um, that you have to accommodate those when you're crossing streets and if there's ever a merger of paths with sidewalks they have to be 10 feet. So here they're clearly creating streets where there might be uh, um, a need to run the path along the sidewalk in order to address topo and crossings and things like that. They're not willing to design it at this point. So the condition that um, was drafted was one to say that, you know, this nothing in the approval is waiving the requirement of creating that interconnected linkage of, of paths, and that if there's construction that happens on the roadways, that um, then has to be ripped up to comply with the standards of creating this path networks, then it's the applicant's risk that they take. Um, what you have, what was handed out in paper copy form was additional language that was added, and I've got this um, additional underlined up there, which is the difference. Um, so there's a lot of merging of CAC language and, um, and with the planning board language, and I think the middle paragraph that's underlined up there should not be included 
because it, <coughs> the CAC has no jurisdiction whatsoever to review permitting and compliance with a special permanent site plan. So um, the original condition is printed out for you um, tonight doesn't have this underscored language um, in it. So that's but, the difference. What, 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 Right, well, the original, but there was, they fixed the typo. This is my, oh, oh. Oh, I believe what I, I handed out tonight does include the, under, the first yeah, set of underscored language. The master plan has been modified. It does, but I'm suggesting that that's not appropriate for a condition that the planning board um, incorporates because the CAC has nothing to do with um, any kind of, has no jurisdiction over reviewing permits. So it doesn't make sense to include them in. Um, but but the, the important point that uh, I think needs to be understood in this condition is that it's a concept master plan. It is evolving over time. It has evolved. Um, and so that, you know, that uh, because there are arrows drawing, drawn on a path showing possible path locations, that, that might not actually be where they go. This, this, plan evolves in regard to market conditions, in regard to further engineering that shows us that certain uh, uh, directions may be infeasible for pathways. Um, and so it, there has to be some recognition that this is merely a concept master plan and that the lines shown may be modified. I think there's, I, and I would argue, I, I agree, there's no, they won't know where the paths can go be until they do a study of how to make those connect. I think, and conceptual is fine, but I think just because the CAC approves the master plan, they're not looking at the detail level and the linkages and the connections. And so um, if you were to look at the master plan that's now pitched in front of the CAC, it's not showing those final connections all the way across the project. And so, um, it can. I would disagree with that. What we are supposed to do, is, and I'm, you'll show, see this on the most recent master plan that I handed out to you, is that we're supposed to make north, south, east, west connections. And we have done that. We have already built the east, west connection right here at the beginning of Village Hill Road. And there's an east, west connection at the top of uh, the Village Hill north. And there's the east-west connection through uh, in the middle. And that east-west connection does not touch the property lines uh, on either side of Village Hill. And you will recall maybe that in the Mosier Street subdivision, we eliminated, we had originally uh, had a proposed location for a pathway that ran behind these cottages. And that was eliminated because, practically speaking, that's a steep cliff at the back of those properties and a big drop off and you really wouldn't want to be directing people onto a pathway like that. Uh, similarly on the other side, we haven't come before you with this, but when we come in with Memorial uh, Park, you'll see that we investigated the topo there and there's a, a steep drop off of 10 to 12 feet between the Memorial Park area and the Beech Tree Walk. Um, so that we think that the connection there is infeasible. Um, and it, nowhere in our special permit did it say that the connections east and west had to touch the property lines. That was never a condition, and we feel that uh, it actually would not enhance the trail system. So we are committed to providing an east-west, north-south uh, interconnected trailway system through the project, um, but we also recognize that certain uh, site conditions would preclude certain areas from having a pathway. But, and this discussion isn't meant to be deciding where that path is going to go. The discussion is really about the condition, and so I think all I'm suggesting is that, and, and it seems like we're, um, both sides are in agreement that it, planning board um, wants to acknowledge that there may be a risk at going ahead and building a street network without fully planning the paths. And all I'm suggesting is that that middle paragraph that was added, the master plan has been modified as overall redevelopment of North Campus has progressed through the planning board site plan approval process. I think that's just um, additional language is not necessary and 
it, there certainly doesn't need to be any reference to the CAC approval of a conceptual master plan um, in this subdivision approval since they don't have jurisdiction to approve any permits. Um, and it, um, I would just suggest that um, the certainly um, we can add language that says the master plan, you know, could be modified through approval from the planning board, which which they have um, identified as wanting to add. But that language that says maybe further mod modified from time to time as development progresses, I would just suggest that that say maybe modified through planning board approval. Um, so that's all I'm suggesting is, is changes, is sort of not as adding that under a scored paragraph in the middle. I, I think it should remain as, as written because that, that is how the development has progressed. That's, that's factually accurate. And it sets the, it sets the, the context for the, the, the um, following uh, sets of underscored language saying that we're going to go through the same process. So it explains what has happened and, and what will happen. If we just said, as it may be further modified from time to time as development progresses, well, we haven't given you the context of how that development has progressed without uh, the first set of underscored uh, sentences. Or Didn't sentences. you say earlier that the master plan is just conceptual? No, it's not a plan. It's not, it's not a design. Correct. So, no, it's not definitive, no. Yeah, so how, I, I, so I'm wondering why the, the master plan doesn't say where you're going to put the, 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 the path. So I'm not sure why. That's correct. That's, yeah, so why is that sentence even needed? I don't understand what that sentence adds. Yeah, I, I, I mean, since the master plan is not a design, I, and the CAC has no jurisdiction over where the paths go or how they connect, they just want to see paths. That that sentence it adds no value to this condition, and I don't, I don't see why it should be in there. I, I think that it's an acknowledgment that the, the conceptual master plan is the... But the conceptual master plan doesn't mean anything. Except that there's going to be houses up there, and there's going to be a path. Right. But that's it. And that's it's essentially what we're saying too. Is no, that no, that's what I'm saying. Well, the, the CAC has no jurisdiction over right. where the paths are, how they connect, where the streets are. So I, I, I agree. I don't see what that sentence is adding. It's, it's I think it's just an acknowledgement of factually how it's gone. I think that adds value. As a condition to this permit for the roads. Personally, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, it doesn't add anything. It doesn't detract from anything. I don't see it. Is there any, does it do any damage? It's just, it's just noise. I don't know. I, yeah. I guess, well, I mean, I mean, I'm we, quite we, happy to leave it there if the, if the applicant wants it. Yeah. I would I would strongly urge you to strike any language that has anything to do with the CAC. Because the yeah. they have nothing to do with it. The CAC right. has nothing to do with it. It's us. So. Cut I'm, out the CAC reference. Right. So I'm, okay. yeah, that way you get rid of the content. Right. <laughs> but to me, I mean, you take out CAC, which I think has to go, and yeah. then what's left is just a statement. It says it might as well right, that we're doing our job. Yeah, I, that's oh. that's fine. I don't know. So we're 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 asking that you catch that up. Who taking out and with the approval of? Oh, sorry, I lost it. Yeah. yeah. We still have that have that first. Uh, Underscore sentence and stop at uh, yeah, Village Hill. Stop at the overall Village Hill project. Period. Period. That being said. Because the other thing is, you know, what's, what's odd about this is we've already agreed we can't talk about the past. It's, it's, that's a site plan. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about conditions on something that you just said, we can't even tell you. All we want you to do is to promise us when you put the paths in when they're designed, if you tear up a road to do it, it's on your dime. Well, th this, this, the, the, this condition was born because of um, uh, more exacting attempts to uh, lay out bike paths that, that everyone agreed in the process was actually not acceptable right now. But it's not there anymore. All those exactly. So this just this just shows where we're, we're good. Where this comes from. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> All right. We're good. So that was number twenty-four.
Uh, number 25. As built shall contain a statement from a lighting engineer that lights have been installed in compliance with these plans. Why a lighting engineer, Carolyn? That's a standard requirement. I don't think we've ever provided one from a lighting engineer. Well, it can be... From the design engineer on the project that they've been installed. Uh, that's, that's fine. Okay. So design engineer instead of lighting engineer? No. No, the, the lighting is actually, the, the photometric plan was developed by the manufacturer of the lights that we're using, that we're specifying for the project. So what are we saying right. so I'm saying just change it to the design. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, that works. Yep. Open space. As offered by the applicant in compliance with the ex special permit granted, all bikeways, trails, and open spaces are to be open for public access, except as noted above. The mechanism for allowing access shall be either through easements or de dedication, whichever the applicant chooses, and shall be recorded prior to submission of the as built for final sign off. And this one, I guess, needs to be deleted. I don't know how it was that relates to the other objectionable conditions that were taken out before. So we're taking that one out. Yeah. Yes. Sanitary sewer. Prior to the pre construction meeting, the applicant must resolve outstanding issues. Massachusetts DEP and receive approval from Massachusetts for sewer line extensions and said approval must be submitted to DPW. Now, since this, this comment was first raised by DPW, MassDEP has been notified and responded that MassDEP does not get involved into the local jurisdiction authority and Gale Associates is working with uh, the DPW to get the formal notice application and approval and we'll get it, we expect to get it before this project is, is begun. So we have to reword this if it's not the Massachusetts DEP? Yeah, initially the, uh, Dave Valida had written it because he thought Mass DEP needed to uh, issue the, the uh, sewer extension permit. But in fact, it's the local uh, DPW. So Carolyn, maybe she's got a next Oh, yeah, I'll see it. All right. 28, tie cards showing location of all water, sewer, and drainage must be submitted to North Hampton DPW prior to requesting street acceptance or release of performance guarantee. Yep, that's generic. Put down the profile for the existing sewer manholes must the manhole to be converted to connect to this new sewer line shows a sweep drop, which does not match the detail. This must be revised. Is that done? That's been handled. That's been done. Can be deleted. Thirty, the sewer pipe drop below ten feet shall be PDC SDR AP. That's uh, addressed as well. A mortar collar all around for the outside drop sewer manhole details shall be included. That's done. Uh, 32, the outside drop sewer manhole details shall be revised as follows. So uh, those are all done. Good, I hate to read this. <laughs> <laughs> Detention pond stormwater erosion control, number 33. The proposed catch basins at the intersection of Village Hill and driveways for the coach house and the proposed townhouse lot shall be moved further north to the apex of the respective radii in order to assure the interception of gutter flow. That's done. 34, the existing drain stub inverts into the existing DMH on Village Hill Road from the coach house and the townhouse lot must be provided to the Department of Public Works. Uh, that's done also. The stub invert. Uh, no, Brandy, come on, we're almost done. <laughs> 35, prior to any ex excavation, all tree protection measures as shown in the detail sheet must be reviewed by the city. Um, yep. So does that mean, Andrew, they're going to you guys? Tree committee? Um, we usually notify Carolyn and then she notifies whomever. Yeah. This is a special case. It's public trees. Well, there's public trees and there's public, you know, but there's public trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> endorsement, mylars, and all electronics and metals required in the subdivision rules shall be submitted with all revisions to detail these conditions shown as well as reference error corrections noted in the comments from the EPW. 37. Except as waived herein all aspects of the subdivision, including construction materials and methods, easements, inspection plans, the process shall conform to the Northampton subdivision regulations. Um, that's it. 38. 38. No, the one that isn't titled. Oh. It's more of a comment than a It's all standard stuff. Um, 
All right, so we have also one, two, three, four, five waivers. Uh, 500 foot center line radius approved for Fort Crossing to Village Hill Road and the 950 foot center line radius of Fort Crossing to Road Bay. Grade approaching intersection with Village Hill exceeds 2%. Up to 3.09% is permitted in this waiver. Cross section for location of sidewalks. Sidewalks should be one foot from the back, right in the front of your guy that needs that one. Intersection angle 90 degree wave to allow 89 degree intersection of Ford and Village Hill. Tree belt should be a minimum of 8 foot wide, no tree closer than 4 feet to the pavement or curves. In the bare areas of budding on street parking, tree belts proposed to be a minimum of 6 foot wide. So that's it. Carolyn, we had a way of the traffic study too. I don't know if that needs to go on there. Uh, we, yeah. we had to address that too. Uh, well, yeah, now we've done through the conditions, we can ask for public comment. Uh, so we're adding one more waiver for the traffic study? Yes. yes. Right. Is there a payment loop tax uh, uh, payment for this? No, well, there. You mean a traffic mitigation yeah, traffic. on the overall member that from the going back to the original special permit? There's a whole list of traffic mitigation, and they have to perform them at different okay. um, junctures where different thresholds of so development. This, so we don't have to put it in here. No, it's because it's already covered. We have a project traffic study that we're required to do okay. on an annual basis. All righty. Any member of the public would like to speak? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. I guess I, I qualify as a public. All that's left here. Um, Jonathan Wright, Wright Builders. Um, thank you for your consideration of this subdivision. It has been uh, uh, exhaustively reviewed by us at Wright Builders. And it, the location of the road reflects actually uh, three different landscape architects' review of the drip line of the trees that was discussed here earlier tonight. And, um, the placement of the lots is specifically designed to protect those trees as well as the placement of the paths. So part of the evolution that you've seen over the last uh, 14 months with the location of this road has been around the, landscape, the natural landscape there. Um, so I think that's important and it's a credit to the mass development engineering effort to make sure that that happens. A number of really nice features that you're incorporating uh, hopefully into your permit grant tonight, the off-street parking, which has turned out to be great at, at Village Hill for visitors and for overflow visiting children and those kinds of things. Um, the layout of the street trees has worked out really well. They're filling in very well. So the standards that you have set up that are being continued uh, in this um, are great for the residents and, and really, I think, um, bear a, a, a great comment on the work of the board and, and the staff and uh, the agencies. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Did we get a review by the fire chief on the radius? I don't know whether that's a good radius or not, but I mean, we've got, we're asking for waivers on turning radiuses. I, have, I don't know what, what those were. Oh, on so the 90 degrees to 89. That, that well, well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's no, no, the, the, the five the lot, but still. A 500 foot center line radius. Oh, oh that, that just means a very slight curve. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I'm asking is that. Does that? Does someone? Is someone telling me that's okay? That's all reviewed by DPW. DPW. Okay, that's, that's okay. all I want to know. Thank you. Okay. We should make the DPW come. Yeah. Don't you think they've suffered through enough of the landfill here? <laughs> we, we should just wait till five o'clock to tell them they have to be here. So. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, all right. Any other comments or questions on this? I think we're going to be seeing. Another permit probably in March, and then hopefully another one, you know, as, they, as the, 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 the southwestern part of the So, may I, may I move to close the public hearing? You may. Uh, all in favor? All right. Brandy, why don't you keep going? Yeah, except I don't have the care about my plate here. Uh, this doesn't have a stuff I want to use. Yeah, bottom. It's up there. Yeah, it says continuation of a hearing. It doesn't say what about. Yeah. Okay. Where's the original one? No, it's the same one. What? Carol, can you read out the. Uh, 
All we have is the, the definitive subdivision for Ford Crossing. Is that enough? Yeah. That's how much we approve the definitive. <laughs> oh, I'm going to make the motion first. That we approve the Ford Crossing definitive subdivision plan at Village Hill. Um, we have the conditions. With the conditions. With, um, with the conditions. And waivers. And waivers. And waivers. Second? Second. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? All right. You all set? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's a lot of talk for 400 people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, I, I, one last thing. I, if I could just say, I'm, I'm very happy to come back on the March 8th meeting and do a more full presentation of the revisions to the master plan. Oh, okay. so, so we, we, we have March 8th already? Okay. okay. Oh, whenever you want. All right. We'll talk to Carol. Linda okay. Manor. Oh, no. I'll back plus one. two more permits. All on March 8th? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we're going to put you off. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. It's going to be a long day. Try to make more sense on the 22nd when Jonathan's going to be here. Oh, yeah, that's what I figured we should do. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right, quickly, we have minutes. Oh, oh, this is for the new you guys got out at 7 yeah. 30. I'm going to have to count 20 minutes. Yeah, we had a few on these. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm going to ignore it. Oh, no, no, this is going to be a few. You're going to be a few. That's not quite accurate because you can get the windows and hearing open at 7 30 or anybody. Yeah, it took a couple of days to close the work. No, yes, you get that? I think that the minutes should be right. Now that you get it, it's my Facebook picture. And I've gotten many comments on it. It's awesome. It sort of sums me up for it. Oh, no. Okay. So I got 
We need five. I think you said you could have one. Yeah, 13 then. No, it's the 12th. It's Monday. Yes, 13th I got knee surgery. So that will be my last garage. Um, oh, they finally let you in? The thing also about the, there are six applications for the community preservation grants, and I can tell people about them next time. Uh, yeah, let's do next time. Yeah. What time is that? Six. Six. Yeah. Um, on Monday the 12th, I, I've agreed to teach a class, but the class might not happen. So, so if we have only four of us. Yes. If you have four, yeah. you can, but it'd be great to have five. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, figure that out. What are you teaching? Planning. It's the ham radio thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 They okay. just came in today, so um, yes, you will. And, I, and everybody, I think we talked about should take a take a drive out there at night mm -hmm. yeah. just to get an idea of the lighting. Were you here for the first? Yeah, time yeah, yeah. Well, but I went and drove. You, yeah. Yeah. We can't talk. I went and drove the driveway that goes all the way up on the this side of the property. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's amazing what's going on on those properties. I mean, I was I counted fourteen cars. Oh, on the property is budding. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, that thing. when I drive by yeah. all the time. Yeah. 14 cars. There's one house. Mm hmm I know the one. It's one of the first ones. Yeah. As well, you're coming Not up. that that affects planning per se, but it just put context over what else. Oh, well, no, no, let's not get into the discussion because yeah. we can't, but, but I'm, what I'm just saying is if you can, go up there at night so you get an idea of the lighting. So that's, I mean, a lot of us do a day trip up there. But a lot of what the neighbors talk about is the lights mm -hmm. and Well, and I have one question that this is my you know, novice. If, if they have trouble with the batteries at 4 in the morning, can, is there anything that can... You guys, well, we can't talk about it. Okay. Um, all right, anything else? I don't know. Let's have a look at that. Second? Yeah, I don't know whether that's... All in favor? I assume you're, you're second. Okay.